Why don't we get started because we've got a full agenda and those of us that live in the deep south where it's snowing today, we want to go home early. So we're on the record. So we're on the record. So we're on the record. And the first subject is the plan to close Woodside. And I must say that um, the To make sure there's no confusion, the plan, to, the plan is not today or tomorrow or this week. It's July 1, and the, it's going to be part of the budget and committee meetings in the Senate and the House, I'm sure. So it's not, I mean, this isn't, this hasn't closed. Um, so I've had a, a number of people who contacted me concerned about the closure of Woodside. And so, um, my, to the best of my knowledge, it's still open, and still some days you have kids there, um, and it's no no dis decisions been made yet by the legislature. The administration will recommend it as part of their 2021 20, budget, and that is not part of budget adjustment. So just so uh, people don't think it's going to be tomorrow. So. With that, um, our first witness is the Honorable Judge Brian Grissom. Good morning. Good morning. Long day yesterday. It was a long day yesterday. It was actually a pretty interesting day. A lot of information. A lot of information. Uh, good morning. Uh, for the record, Brian Grissom, Chief Superior Judge. Um, Speaking to the topic of the plan to close Woodside, um, I will confess I'm not sure how much help I can be to this committee on this subject. Um, I have heard from uh, some judges, not a lot, um, concerns when they read that the, there's a potential closing. I think that concern, to the extent that it's out there, from, from individual judges is that um, it is the only uh, secure facility for youth in the state. And so their question is, if it's not there, what are the options? Um, I, I would begin by reminding the committee that, quite frankly, the judiciary has very little authority in uh, who goes to the Woodside. The statutes are, have been were amended, I think it was two years ago, to indicate that we cannot send someone to Woodside unless we have a recommendation of the Department of Children and Family. That's in the, in the predisposition phase. Um, and that's only if uh, the department recommends placement there and that the court finds that there's no other uh, safe or secure setting uh, and that there is a need to send uh, the youth there. Um, in post-disposition delinquency proceedings, the commissioner has the sole authority to decide who goes to this stuff. So our, um, our, our authority to send someone there is, is, is limited by statute. Um, I, I would also remind the committee that we should be looking at probably two different uh, populations, one the 16 and 17 year olds, which can be considered in case under criminal law, uh, and those 15 and under. I think the real problem becomes that second population, 15 and under, because there are no other uh, options uh, for that population, uh, assuming that they warrant a secure setting. The, um, the 16 and 17 year olds, there is an option in the sense that because of, of that age, uh, because they can be considered adults, um, that there is a memorandum of understanding between the Department of Corrections and the Department of Children and Families uh, as it relates to the Marble Valley facility in Rutland. And that is, my understanding is they have four beds uh, in their segregation unit that if necessary, if uh, behavior or discipline issues normally uh, support placement there, that they have the means to house up to four for uh, youth there. But again, that's only 16 and 17 year old. Yeah. They are prohibited from having anyone under that age. <coughs> so in, in that sense, um, if, 
the circumstances warrant it, there, there is that option available for that age, they, 16 and 17, but beyond that. Um, my information is that they have one person under 18 right now. At Marble Valley? I believe it would be Marble Valley, I'm not sure. The facility, I wasn't, I, I, don't, I don't have what facility they have, one 16 year old in the car. Yes. Now, if you know how it changes day to day, tomorrow yeah. it may be zero or maybe two. Right, and if you had a 17 year old in there today, essentially placed there under this memorandum of understanding between ACF and the Department of Corrections, if he turns 18 tomorrow, he will be placed in the general population. Yeah. So, um, when, and this isn't, uh, it's part of the discussion, when the law changes on July 1 to include 18 year olds in that category and then 19 year olds, is there any, what are the discussions we're going to have to have is what to do with that population? I think that's clearly a discussion that's going to have to take yeah. place. Um, so, can I just ask that once yeah. the law changes, then it would be all, all youth up to nine, up to nineteen. Well, uh, as we phase it, it'll start with eighteen-year-olds as we July for But as far as looking at two different what, populations, what is going on? Still have kids that can be in adult court at the younger age. Depending on the nature of the crime. Uh -huh. But by bringing eighteen-year-olds into juvenile court. Uh -huh. Raises another issue of if they have to be detained, um, they'll have to be in and I, correction. I'm happy that the Commissioner of Children and Families is here. One of the things that I think a lot of the emails I've been getting, people are confused. Only delinquent children can be placed at Woodside, is that correct? Yes. So that's correct. A lot of people are seeing that there's a large number of kids out of state and are saying, well, you shouldn't be sending kids out of state and you've got a facility. But those may be kids who are unmanageable, beyond the control. I used to use the term unmanageable. You have a different term now. Um, but uh, it, do we know how many delinquents are actually out of state? So I might ask that question of either you or the commissioner. Uh, but yes, so we do have, this is Ken Schatz, Commissioner of the Department of Children and Families. I apologize to Pearson for seeing That's student. all right. That's all right, Commissioner. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> but we, I'm just going through my notes to give you the specific number. Um, oh, thank you. Um, so I, I think that, uh, no, but, right, we, this is not the link with those. I, I do have that information. Give me a couple of minutes. Okay, to get no problem. Your, right? I just was, before this, uh, before we complete yes. our discussion on Woodside, it's a much smaller number it than is. the total that are out of state. Correct. The numbers I had off uh, information provided by the yes, department, I think, included children of others with the link. Right. So I don't have that. Yeah, so it's, it's 38. 38. Christine Johnson. Thank you. Let me give credit where it's due. Uh, of the 140 um, youth placed out of state, 38. Of delinquent. the 140 youth placed out of state, yes. 38 are delinquent. Yeah. Oh, 60. I'm sorry. In total residential care, I was talking about. So I apologize. For the 60 out of state, um, actually, 20 are delinquent youth placed out of state. I'm, I, I apologize because I'm responding from our perspective, and again, we've talked about this, I don't want to go on too long. Right. The dis real distinction is youth in residential <coughs> care, not out of state. Because so many of our out of state placements are actually close by in border sales. So again, I apologize for not responding yeah. accurately, but so 20 youth are delinquent, are placed in out of state programs. And how many of them are at Beckett? I'm sorry? How many are at Beckett? I have that. Um, I have um, four delinquent youth are placed in Beckett School in New Hampshire. So 16 or another place. I wanted to, the reason that Beckett's important to me, Beckett used to be in Bennington. Um, and they had a change in terms of what they do, and I don't know all the details, but 
they moved the boys to New Hampshire and kept the girls in Bennington. And so the girls are in Bennington or in state, would be in state and the boys are out of state. <coughs> It, it may not be much, but it, those four kids would could be considered to be in-state placements in residential treatment, in my view, because they're right across the river. We agree. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Judge? Yeah, I just think uh, what we're seeing, of course, is the declining population in Woodside. Um, I think it's fair to say that there are always going to be cases and circumstances that require some uh, level of secured setting is a question of how much. And, uh, if, if, this, if Woodside was built for 30, I think it's been a long time since we've needed a facility that size. Um, yeah. But the more options available you know, to the judiciary, the, the better we can address the, the issues that, that, that you bring to us. So um, I'm not sure if I have to answer any questions. No. So I have a question. So. I keep going back, where, where are they going to be? Where are they going to be housed? Even if it's for a week or two months, where are they going to be housed? And by default, are we going to be putting them in a correctional facility and under DOC budget? Yeah. We can. Uh, so where, where are they going to go? Well, that's why I'm saying. I think there's always going to be a need. It's a matter of, of right sizing that, that, that that's, need. That's I think that's the question that the legislature and the administration need to answer as we move forward from here until we finish the 2021 budget. You can't leave here <coughs> next session without some decision about where those kids are going to go. There needs, if they're not going to be at Woodside, they need to be in a some kind of facility <coughs> that has no reject. And how secure a facility? Well, it has to be a secure facility. Secure that, that's, that's the issue. Let me age myself here. <laughs> um, We're all aging ourselves. Well, you know, I started the program at 204 Depot in Bennington in 1971. And we were an alternative to the week school. Mm -hmm. um, and the week school operated. <coughs> then there was period of time where people in higher office decided to do away with the week school and deinstitutionalize. And they understood that all the tough kids would go to Camp Iwanaki in Benson. That plan, that was a private nonprofit run by the Eckhart Foundation. Those of you who may be familiar with drug stores in the South, they were all Eckhart's drugs much like CBS today. The Eckerd Foundation um, ran Camp, Camp Iwanaki, but soon the DC, it was SRS back then, mm -hmm. found that those kids that they thought were all going to be the tough kids couldn't go to um, Camp Iwanaki, and they needed an alternative. And we were taking some of them at 204 Depot, and some of them went elsewhere. Then there was the horrific murder in Essex Junction. And after that, the state decided it needed a secure residential facility. And there was a fight between the legislature, the governor, and others at that time. I think Mike Smith and you were in the legislature then. And your decision came into a 30-bed facility, 15 beds for treatment, 15 for attention, and they built Woodside. In the meantime, there was the um, there was a program at the state hospital operated by Washington County Mental Health that was in and I got to tell you it was one of the worst <coughs> places I've ever visited but it was in a you know, I can best describe it as I remember it now um, you'd walk through the tunnel if you remember in the state hospital and there was a wing or something that had I think four beds at the time. And then it expanded to eight, and the state took it over, and that was before we said. So Washington County Mental Health ran the secure detention facility. So I have a question for Judge Manhattan. 
Was that a history lesson? Don't tell me. Okay. And you picked out things that I knew about. So, see, we didn't even close to the school. You even knew about Benson, didn't you? You probably went there. Were you there? Were you there? No, I was not. I might have drove by. Driven by. So, for the judge and maybe uh, the commissioner will have to weigh in on this. So, that's the use that are, are ordered to detention. And so when you order them to detention, and I think I heard that DCF has authority to put them up at currently at Woodside, what type of, do they get any program or are they just doing dead time waiting for a court hearing? Well, of course it depends if, if it's a waiting hearing, waiting for a merits hearing. If they're there pre-merits, um, Ken and his staff can certainly answer better than I, but I would assume the program is somewhat limited at that point because they may not be there for very long. Uh, but they, they, it is the department that has the authority to, to go there. It's federal law that requires certain things happen. Um, and I'm sure the department goes beyond federal law. I'm trying to think what I'm trying to Ken would like to answer your question. I'm not sure he would. Uh, oh, I won't we'll take up Judge Reese's time. No, no, it's all right. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about what the discussion is going to be at further on in January now. Sure. The, the, the answer is we do provide a therapeutic approach, even if it's for a youth who's only there for a few days. And that includes we have um, we have clinical staff at Woodside, we have youth counselors who on a day-to-day -day basis always provide appropriate care that is focused on the youth, the youth's needs, how can we enable the youth to be successful ultimately in returning to the community? We're actually, you know, we have some challenges, things we always need to improve upon to be sure, but at the same time, we work very hard to provide a therapeutic uh, care for even those youth who come to Woodside for a short period of time. Okay, we we'll start the conversation with that later on. Thank you. Thank you. Bill? Um, so this isn't for Judge Pearson, and I apologize. And I also apologize for being a little late. Um, but to echo the question about where, where will these people be if we go to a post-Woodside future, I, I have heard from the administration a fairly firm posture that they want to close Woodside, which would suggest to me that they must have at least a reasonably firm idea about where the, where the uh, the need would um, pivot. So I'm wondering, uh, I don't see on the agenda today um, either Ken or Commissioner Touchette to, to speak to those questions. And I'm, and I'm wondering, can we get an answer from the administration about what their best concept is? I think that's why they decided that I can't speak for the administration. Um, but I did, I scheduled the administration last meeting. Yeah. So they were here and um, my recollection was that that's something that they're working on right now as to what will be the alternative, what will they use if Woodside closes here. The dilemma is that the 20, it won't, it'll be part of the 2020 budget. So the 2021 budget, excuse me. So the standing committees, institutions, in the House and the Senate, and um, Judiciary in the Senate will have the opportunity to ask those questions as well as health and welfare in the Senate. I understood. I, I guess my, my concern is that if the administration moves forward in a hundred small ways with the assumption that Woodside is going to be closed, it, it prejudges the question. It makes it harder at that point to pull back, exactly. and if they don't have a, again, a reasonably firm concept of what replaces Woodside, I, I would look for a commitment to them not to prejudge the issue, not to move personnel, move money, move other things that would make it more difficult to keep Woodside open, um, because I haven't heard a suggestion either last meeting or so far today or in the media or from any person in the administration that they have a concept um, about replacement. So um, well, that's, a, that's a pressing concern because it becomes facts on the ground in the absence of 
that replacement. Well, you have a uh, <coughs> same date of December 5th, 2019, mm -hmm. in the packet that I haven't had a chance to read and doubt anybody else has. That says that to Steve Howard, who's our next witness, um, the correspondence is to provide you a notice that the Department of Children and Families intends to seek proposals from interested parties to provide trauma-informed treatment services for youth with serious behavior and mental health needs should DCF enter into a contract classification positions with VSA's bargaining units may be eliminated. This DCF intends to issue the enclosed request for proposal on or after January 9, 2020. And since we aren't there yet, I suspect that's when the question could be. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that kind of sets in motion where the administration's at. But I would add that it, part of the governor's budget, which will be presented on Tuesday, the 19th of January, were to be that they're going to cut six million dollars that's currently allocated to Win Woodside. That makes if we have a different opinion, we need to come up with a six million dollars mm -hmm. to fund Woodside. But well, uh, but I'm not answering your question because I can't answer your question because we won't know in January twenty-first. Twenty-first. Yeah, or 19th, and, and whatever the date is, it doesn't matter. First. And I see, they, they spoke about this last time that they were going to have an RFP. Um, it just... Um, Do we have any more questions for the judge? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, that's all right. I, you weren't here at the beginning when I said that. There's not much I can do. Well, I'm going to anyway. Judge, no, thank you very much. <laughs> hey, thanks for the You're opportunity. You're dismissed. <laughs> All right, so clearly when we dismiss the judge, all the committee assistants are leaving. They're not because, they're not, not because of your question. Peggy introduced them before you came in, and they're, they're our new committee assistants for this session, and they were just here to observe. And, and maybe if I could just um, yeah. follow up one more time. Okay. At the very least, it seems like the administration should be able to um, give us a sense of what the RFP is looking to accomplish. Are they, are they simply putting out uh, a general call for ideas? In other words, the community and providers can solve this problem, or do they have themselves? They've got the provider network all worried. Okay. I can tell you that, because there was another RFP that went out earlier this week mm -hmm. that I suspect was part of the family's first effort that the federal requirements, and so they yeah. they've got all of the. Ken, would you join us for <laughs> no more than five minutes? And then I don't mean to take time. I but they time. sent out an RFP, and I've been getting anxious calls from the provider groups and emails because the RFP is part of that family's first that was presented to us or maybe it was the Child Protection Committee. Anyway, so they're looking at, oh, you're doing away with all the group homes because um, the RFP looks like it's going to be expanded foster care. So everybody's nervous in the provider community, the staff at Woodside is obviously worried, and Senator Baruth and us, us are worried too about what you're doing. So in five minutes or less, can you tell, tell us what you're doing? doing? So, so again, Ken Shatz, Commissioner of the Department of General. So there are two different RFPs. That's correct. Right. And I'm glad to talk at more length. I don't want to take up the time right. on your schedule with So I'm glad to come back whenever you want or can, to talk in more broadly. But the, the, the way to think about this from my perspective, and I do appreciate the concerns. I understand it. But honestly, it is looking at our whole residential system of care from a construct perspective. The, the, there are two RFPs out. One is to look for a consultant to help us look, and I, when I say us, I mean the Agency of Human Services, look at all of our residential uh, programs, both in terms of the programs that uh, DCF utilizes, but also the programs that the Department of Mental Health utilizes to try to have an appropriate system. We are not talking about eliminating residential programs. We're not talking about eliminating group homes. But I, 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 
But what we want to do is right-size them. What we want to do is make sure, because the evidence through research is pretty clear that kids do better in terms of long-term outcomes in family-like environments closer to home. That doesn't mean there isn't a very significant place for residential programs. And there is a spectrum or a continuum of a level of security, and this is where Woodside or a secure facility comes into play. Absolutely, I do want to be clear with you. I recognize that we need to have a high security placement for a relatively small number of Vermont youth. That's the point that I do want to emphasize. I do not believe we need a 30-bed facility to serve in that purpose, which is why we're making the recommendation. Um, and so, is that the second RFP? The, the second RFP, exactly. The second RFP, thank you for, for the, the reminder that I get to it. The second RFP is looking, and you were involved in this conversation, or some of you were involved, recognizing that we did need to have a capacity for residential care for youth who do have behaviors that are challenging, that are difficult to manage, that may be violent, um, that may not be met by the existing mental health system, and so that we do need some additional capacity for that particular need. And just, if you could ballpark it right now, I understand the RFP is coming a, a little yeah. later. What's the capacity for that? So it's interesting. I appreciate that question. What, and some of you have seen the drafts. Well, we're saying it could be anywhere from 5 to 15 uh, beds. And this is not your typical RFP where we're simply saying we're going to select one provider. It might be more than one, and that's where the residential consultant comes into play. Because what we want to do is look at our system to make sure we're appropriately meeting the needs of Vermont youth and do it as much as possible within Vermont. So the idea would be is, for example, going to this point, we may um, get a proposal that will give us a high security facility for three to five beds. That might meet our needs for that level of security. On the other hand, we might get proposals for uh, a facility for 10 to 15 beds that might have a variety of levels of supervision. That might be another way to meet the variety of needs uh, of Vermont one, youth. One last question, if I could. So um, if I remember the, the timing, it's the 2021 budget that this is planned for. Um, so is the idea to have the RFP go out for the consultant in January, have that person provide, to hire that person, then have them provide expertise on the second RFP? No, it is not, it's not, they, they are actually held <laughs> together. They're two separate RFPs, okay. it's not a series. That, the RFP for the consultant is actually out now. Okay. Um, the RFP for the long-term facilities is the one that's not coming out until later because we're respecting the statute regarding privatization agreements. It's not clear that it necessarily is one, but we want to be respectful um, of the union's interest here, and so they have some time to review that. So they're not necessarily joined, but, but they do are related. Thank you. I think, I think we're going to just, because uh, I, I do have witnesses scheduled, but I think, I thank you very much for the explanation. No, I appreciate it. Um, but we're going to be, I mean, this is something that will be part of the, certainly part of the discussion, and then obviously it leads to another discussion. If you do close Woodside, what do you do with a 30-bed facility? Oh, that's open for lots of people. We've already suggested lots of things. I understand we'll take that. Take care but, of that one. <laughs> well, thank you. We, we feel really good about that. The house will take care of it. Cheryl, you don't even have to worry. You don't have to worry. The Senate will just rubber stamp whatever the house does. Thank you very much. Wait, I have uh, James more Pepper. On, my on what? On um, Well, I let me tell you. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, Commissioner. Maybe you want to send a little blurb out to the group homes and everything. We're not trying to do away with you right away. <laughs> I will be glad to do that. My understanding is something was sent out from the Department of Health, but I well, really I don't know. But the the message I got from a certain <laughs> facility that you can guess the name of was okay. very nervous. And for the record, James Pepper, Department of State Attorneys and Sheriffs, in recognizing the time and the witness list, I'll be brief, and I did testify last Appreciate week. Appreciate that, yes. Um, you know, our position is unchanged, uh, that there, uh, we don't have any specific 
need for Woodside uh, specifically, but there is a need for sec secure beds. There's a need for a secure facility of some sort. And um, you don't have to look any further than last year's admissions to Woodside to see what that need actually is. Um, so while you know, there might only be two to five kids at any given time at Woodside, there were 71 admissions to Woodside last year. These included kids that were already in DCF custody that became violent or aggressive, um, or they needed just, a, they were in the throes of a mental health crisis and needed stabilization. Um, and the existing facilities um, were not, well, six kids were rejected by all other facilities last year. Um, three were screened for needing hospital level psychiatric care, but were too aggressive or violent to be replaced at the Brattleboro or retreat. Um, there were 12 that assaulted um, either the staff or other residents that needed to go for a short stay in Woodside. Um, there are youth that are, you know, maybe aging out of jurisdiction or um, just need to have need a longer term solution um, that were placed in Woodside while that longer term solution was being worked out. There's 20 admissions for that for those types of folks last year. Um, and then of course there's the very rare situations that you can't really plan for. Um, and you know it's no, and then there's the interstate compact youth, you know, those are very often short stays. The point is that there is no other place for these kids if you go to Woodside. Um, we're not tied to Woodside as the facility, the place for it. We've been in, I've been in conversations with Ken about what the alternatives are. You've heard some of them um, today. Uh, you know, there's an RFP that is very open-ended, it sounds like. Um, that includes creating more staff secure beds at existing facilities, changing the policies of existing facilities so that they're dealing with the kind of kids in mental health crisis or that become aggressive differently. Um, continuing to use out-of-state placements, um, and then potentially a small secure facility. You know, you, you, two or three times you mentioned mental health, mm -hmm. and frankly, that wasn't the group that was supposed to be at Woodside. Mm -hmm. That was supposed to be the delinquent youth who had committed crimes. I realize that some of those kids in mental health crisis assaulted staff members or did something else that is criminal in nature. But it's a sad state of affairs in this state, and I'll say that very clearly to everyone. It's a sad state of affairs in this state where we we'll use the corrections department or the juvenile justice system for people who have significant mental health issues, <coughs> and it should stop. I think it's, it's the, of all the things that I've seen in my years, it's more and more we are using those types of facilities for people with significant mental health issues because of the failure of the legislature and countless administrations to come to grips with our mental health problems in the state. And it's, it's pretty sad. It, it just points to the deficit. And it shouldn't be Commissioner Schatz's or Commissioner Touchette's problem. Um, this is really a, a crisis. And you point that out very aptly. And I, I suspect that those kids that get either sent to 204 Depot, get sent to something else residential, and then bomb out, it's because there were mental health crises. And it's, it, it really does point to a deficit that we have. And I realize that there's no other choice than DCF, Woodside, or corrections institutions because of the mental health system. But that, that really is something that I think this committee should be strongly recommending to our colleagues <coughs> that, um, and I, I know nobody from Ledge Council is here right now, but maybe you can. Becky. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I was looking at that. <laughs> sorry, Becky. Yeah. Could you prepare a memo on behalf of the Justice Oversight Committee? urging that it's inappropriate to continue to place people in either Woodside or jails because we have no other place for mental health. Absolutely. Who are going to send us? Our colleagues? Or Our administration? colleagues. Administration. Well, we can send a copy to the administration, but I think they already know it. But I think some of our colleagues have 
when we, you know, and maybe some of the problems that we've seen publicly about Woodside, and I know about some of the group homes because I still stay in touch with many of them, some of the problems that they're facing with clients where they have to do restraints and et cetera are because those clients were inappropriately placed. And I, I, I just, that was a little better by me, but on the other hand, I think it's an important message. I think <coughs> Thank you very much yes. for your testimony. Yeah, I think just for investing, you know, is only looking at the adult system, but I think they've raised a lot of the same concerns. Yeah, I think so too. I think that's, you know, and I'm, I, we're not, it's not just Vermont, by the way. Other states are in the same, well, it's not just Vermont, but I think. Well, we pride ourselves on deinstitutionalization. Yeah. But we are institutionalizing people in the wrong yes. institution. Thank you. So it's happening. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, with that said, <laughs> here I come with all the save the day, right? We're here to say, <laughs> I might even no, understand <laughs> oh, position you've got long-term good state employees, some of them I work with, well, I don't want to age them. <laughs> well, we have two of them here today. <laughs> no, but, well, they don't look as old as you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they don't look as old as me, I don't know. They were just kids when I was in my career. But we used to work very closely with the inside. Um, we'd send kids there for the weekend just to give them a taste of what was happening, and. When we then I would drive up and say, hey, "Do you want to come back? Or do you want to stay here?" <laughs> Usually the response was, "I want to come back," but it wasn't necessarily because Woodside was such a bad place. But freedom was a little different. So I had it. It it, it served the purpose, a short-term attention. It also served the purpose for long-term treatment for some kids back in the day. It was, it was very. Usually, I would drive up there and be 30 kids there. Um, you know, maybe 28, whatever. There'd usually be 15 on the detention side, 15 on the treatment side, who were considered long term. So, anyway. Right, thank you, Senator. Um, so, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, the two members of the VSEA who are here today um, Alex Hodgetts, who has uh, worked for Woodside for 13 years as a, a clinical services administrative coordinator. And Scott Green has worked there for 23 years as a youth counselor. Scott's the one I used to be. He was very young then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're here to make sure I don't say anything that's too crazy and, and to answer any of your questions that have the, I'm sure, the real information, the actual information you might be looking for. Um, I think our members want to start by saying, really, by really asking the question what is Woodside? And Woodside is not just a building. Uh, anybody who has seen that building understands that that building needs additional investment. So we're talking about something much greater than just a building, uh, which I think people can get sort of hooked, hooked on, thinking that, well, the building is bad, so therefore we have to replace one side. Um, I do want to say that uh, the Defender General testified last week that there's no magic behind, behind a locked door. And um, whether that's true or not, I'll leave that to others to decide. But I will say there is some magic. Uh, to what happens behind the doors of Woodside. Our members feel that the picture uh, that has been painted of Woodside is um, in the op-ed piece that you have now available to you is unrecognizable to the folks who work every day there from what they read in the press and what they hear in the courtrooms across the state. Woodside is nationally recognized for its outstanding therapeutic and cl clinical care provided to children. It's in the 99th percentile nationally of the metrics used to assess programs like Woodside. It's assessed by a program called PDS, which is part of the Department of Justice review of programs provided to youth. Uh, Woodside is a place where youth who stay for at least 90 days increase their academic functioning and average of one and a half grade levels in math and literacy. It's part of a, a network of Vermont community partners that deliver services to kids. It's the only no eject reject facility that serves the highest needs youth in the state. And because of that status, they get an extra level of scrutiny um, that's provided, that, that really uh, 
They can because they take kids and youth that have been rejected by everyone else in the state, mostly due to violent behavior. Um, our members feel like there's been sort of an ongoing campaign of sorts um, that is difficult for them to really come to terms with. Um, and when you work with the most challenging youth, the most violent, you know, it's hard to see a teenager be violent. It's hard to see them in a state of self-harm. And it's hard to see them attack a staff member. And to watch, it's really even more difficult. Some folks may have seen the video or heard about the video that's been um, used to justify some of the decisions around Woodside. It's hard to see coworkers race in to protect their coworker's life. That's what happens in many of these cases. But you won't read about that in BT later. That's not part of the story in BT later. The use of restraints and seclusions are actually on the decline at Woodside. The training and the tactics our members are using uh, is working. Since 2015, restraints have dropped from 116 to 36. Seclusions from 320 to 98. Our members have been asking for a while for additional tools that have not been provided to them to make dangerous situations even less dramatic for the youth involved. They've done the best with what they could and the resources we've provided them. For our members, I think um, they would urge the legislature not to repeat past mistakes. The administration's plan sounds eerily familiar. Reduce state-controlled beds, rely exclusively on community-based solutions, use private contractors. We've seen this movie before. It's called the Vermont Mental Health System. And we know how it ends. Vulnerable people stacked up in emergency rooms are shipped away, out of sight, out of mind. Contrary to testimony you heard last week from the Defender General, the mental health crisis may have begun with a flood, but the backups in the ERs came when the new system, relying on community partners, proved inadequate to the demand, and the state's publicly owned infrastructure was too meager to meet the needs of the people on their side. Just last April, April of 2019, we had a very distinguished group of people come together, put their minds together, and spend months and months and months for putting together a report for this legislature. A very distinguished group of people on this list, people with decades of expertise. Just last April, their conclusion, no stakeholder or member of the April 2019 work group thought that the state of Vermont could responsibly advocate for the complete elimination of Woodside. Only last April. Last April, there must be a, peak, a place for those not welcomed by in-state or out-of-state facilities. So one thing that has not changed is the fact that some youth who pose a significant risk to themselves, to others, community, or property require some amount of security or secure treatment or intervention. You heard that, I think, from Judge Pearson and from the state's attorney's office as well. The only decision that is being made by the legislature is whether we care for our own or we send them to a private contractor. The administration's proposal is about one thing, money. It's only about the money. Vermont State employees perform all of the services in the RFP that is provided to you. You provide that RFP so you can see that a call for a contract to be in place in May of 2020. And I really appreciate what Senator Sears had to say and what, and what Senator Bruce asked, because our members feel like this is really being set up as a foregone conclusion. And there's been very little effort um, uh, to dissuade the legislature from taking serious, I'm glad to hear that the legislature is going to take some more testimony and dive deeply into this issue because we feel like there's a lot more of the story that needs to be told. Um, the major difference between what is called for in the RFP and what happens now is that the Woodside, our Woodside has established a whole network of relationships with programs in the community that they work with. All right. So taking Woodside out of the equation and turning it over to a private contractor leaves a giant hole in the system. And what we did, we provided this RFP to our members and we asked them to look at the work that they do every day and look at the work that the administration is asking for from this private contractor and tell us what the difference is. And the major difference is the relationship that they have with existing uh, providers in the community. So the population of Woodside, there's been a lot of talk about the day the population hit zero. And I think you heard Judge Gerson say, and we would agree with that, that 
DCF controls the flow of kids that go to Woodside. So it may be not a huge surprise that it got to zero. Um, but if you look at the statistics over time, unfortunately I didn't have a chance to make a copy of this, but if you look at just at this chart, you see that the population ebbs and flows. It ebbs and flows, it ebbs and flows. And yes, the media reported a large story about hitting zero. But just last April, there were 17 kids at Woodside. And next April, there could be 17 more. But that's not what gets reported in the press. That's not what gets told to, to legislators. Um, I think what's important is the kids who go to Woodside require a great deal of time. They experience a great deal of trauma. Uh, they've had significant challenges. And I think one of our members' observations, both from Woodside and the State Hospital, is one of the major miscalculations in building of the mental health system we have today is the amount of time people would need in those beds. And the fact that it takes them longer to get to step back up. And that's really what caused major parts of the backup in the mental health system that I know none of us wanted or wanted to continue. And according to DCF's own reporting, Woodside is the only in-state program exclusively for delinquent youth, and it's the only in-state residential program with consistently available capacity. That's from DCF's own report. According to DCF, out of only seven out of 27 other state programs have a primary focus on serving youth but these programs serve both DCF CHINS cases and delinquent youth and are consistently at capacity. Consistently at capacity. So we think that's a repeat of what we saw with the mental health system. And I think we urge, the reason I'm really glad to hear what Senator Sears said, and the, the desire of the legislature to dig deeply into this issue and not let May 1st on an RFP be the day, the deadline. It's because this is a very serious situation that we think could have this very serious, the same end, or the same result that we had with the mental health system, and we're very concerned about that. Um, last year, there were 61 kids served by, by Woodside, in the police, where we're standing today, from, from the State House. Woodside is 42 minutes away, 40 miles away. More, almost half of the kids that were sent out of state were sent to facilities in Massachusetts. All of those facilities are three hours away, up to 191 miles away. Not exactly next door. For a lot of families with limited resources, it might as well be California. Massachusetts is that far away. They're not going to see those kids. Those kids are not going to see them. It depends on where you live. Too. I mean, in Bennington. <laughs> it does. But you're talking about Rutland, Mass, uh, Natick. Um, it does depend where you live. But if you're in the center of the state, just to give you an example, from the center of the okay. state, that's where they are. Well, we, not everybody lives in the center of the state. I'll only, only point that out to you as a representative from Bennington. Yes. But many years in Rockland. Many years. I know, I know the know how far it is. Um, so our members um, would ask, I think, what you've already committed to, which is to do your due diligence and not to allow this to be rushed or to become a foregone conclusion. Woodside has made tremendous progress. You've invested time and energy and money in creating a therapeutic program that's gotten great results. And our position would be to not abandon that, to not walk away from your investment, to not walk away the commitment that 45 of our members have made to making this a therapeutic place that is delivering services to kids but instead to make additional investments in state-controlled, state-owned infrastructure so that we can build a better inside. I, I, I want to move along, but I want to clarify my statement to make sure that you heard me clearly today. If, if the governor announces whenever the date of the state of the budget address, budget address uh, I believe it's January 21st, announces that his budget has taken $6 million that was Slated for Woodside and put it into something else. That means to keep Woodside going, the legislature needs to find six million dollars that it doesn't currently have. Mm -hmm. So we need to uh, 
So I, I just caution you that I, I didn't, I don't want to lose sight of that. And that's always a difficulty for us, um, particularly uh, as legislators trying to un, you know, unravel a numbers. <laughs> And it's sort of yeah, like a huge I, challenge. I, I understand that. No, yeah. I don't want to make people <clears throat> feel that way. I also, I understand the administration's position and why they've chosen to move in this direction. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and it's partly the loss of the federal funds. So, so I, I, I think, Senator, you, you touched on two very big issues. What our members would hope is that we would make the investments in Woodside that are needed in order to I want to leave time to hear from Scott now. Okay. Um, before I go, let me just finish this yeah, one statement. Please. That we make the investments in Woodside study that are needed so that we can pursue federal funding again. And we not walk away from a state-owned facility and leave the system short of beds. And Alex and, and Scott, do you want to? They, they want to come up together. Come up and, if, if you want to stay there, that's fine. Tom, maybe we can bring up a couple of chairs. Jump right in there. Tom's a good Red Sox fan. Thank you, Senator. Anytime. Welcome, anytime. I'll say it again. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah. Thank you for having uh, making the time for us today. We certainly appreciate it. Um, one of the things that uh, many of the uh, and as was addressed, I'm currently the clinical care coordinator at Woodside, uh, but I've, I've operated in several roles and capacities from temp youth counselor to uh, shift supervisor uh, over my 13 years with it. Uh, and the narrative that is out about Woodside uh, with regard to the practices that happen there couldn't be any further from the truth, and I just wanted to. Uh, to address you might want to slide that microphone a little sure. bit closer. Absolutely. Um, the, the narrative that's, that's out there right now about what's going on in Woodside is, is patently untrue. Um, the Defender General would have you believe that Woodside has such a pervasive culture of abuse and neglect uh, that it counters all of the people's hypocritic oath that come into the building, um, all the people's uh, commitment to providing safe and ethical treatment for the kids. Um, we do not assault, we do not harm kids in our facility. Um, so that, that was just one thing I wanted to, to clarify. Uh, there's definitely difficulty in the work that we do. Um, things do happen over, over the course of the day-to-day -day operation facility that do not always present as buttoned up and, and beautiful on, on, the, on video. Um, but we just wanted to clarify that as well. Um, with regard to the, the population of Woodside and the daily headcount and the diminished numbers that have been presenting over the last several months. Um, as has been discussed, the, the department has control over that, and so it essentially becomes what I would, what I would call a shell game. Um, in looking to avoid the most secure uh, placement available, uh, looking for the least secure placement available uh, for the youth, they're not always, in my opinion, looking for the best and most suitable placement available for the kids. Um, so keeping kids out of Woodside uh, may not be in their best interest, uh, but that's not being factored into the equation necessarily because uh, the kid goes to a Beckett program and commits an assault, and then they can go to a 204 program. They may not be welcome back into that Beckett program because Woodside's the only no reject, no reject. <clears throat> uh, so now Beckett's off the table, even though it was listed as their the best placement available for that youth. Beckett's now off the table. Um, so then they go to 204 until the placement is available at a, uh, another in-house, in-state placement. Um, and this continues. And what we're, what we're doing is essentially letting the youth practice their risk, uh, where they can go to a facility and be dangerous and disruptive in a program to leave the program because they don't want to do the difficult work that, that they have ahead of them. Uh, overcoming trauma to identify and work on your risk is challenging. Um, but as we, if we don't hold them to working on that, then what we're essentially doing is kicking the can down the road um, until they're close enough to 18 where we say, all right, well, DCF has done what we can with this youth. Uh, we're gonna discharge three weeks ahead of their 18th birthday. Good luck. Um, and I don't, I, don't, I don't believe that that's in the best interest of any of the kids that we're serving at Woodside uh, or in the state. I, mean, what, what I, I believe that the law says you have to place 
kids in the least restrictive environment possible. Right. So that may be part of the, the defense of not, I don't want to see it, defending at DCF, but no, no, um, I, fully I, I, I the part of their challenge is that they're required under the law to place kids in the least restrictive environment possible. Which as as the, the, uh, the previous gentleman had, had stated, uh, the, the, the department has asked for and recommended potential changes in programming at other facilities around the state to accommodate for these youth. Um, and I guess the question from the members that, that I've spoken to is, why wouldn't we change the the verbiage around what Woodside is instead of instead of changing, looking for all these uh, different placements available to kind of put this patchwork team together, why not draw the program up that you have available to you with the resources, the amazing resources that we've compiled on one side over the last, you know, since 1986 when we've been built. Uh, we have community partners established. We have a strong network of employees with tenures, you know, exceeding 35 years. Um, the care and compassion that the kids receive at one side is noted by the number of kids that continuously call us uh, responding, uh, just calling to say, hey, look, I'm 32 years old now. I just want to call and say, thanks, guys. I got my life together because of the stuff that, that, uh, that happened at Woodside because you guys cared. You guys gave us that, uh, gave us that compassion. Um, so when, you, when you've assembled this team of quality, capable, and uh, devoted staff members and built sort of the infrastructure of a well-oiled machine, the only part missing being the facility, uh, it seems like instead of breaking apart the team that's been assembled to uh, to fix the problem that we that we address the infrastructure around. I, I want to, again, I'm not trying to defend the Department of Children and Families, um, but they did come with recommendations for a um, new Woodside or new facility and recognize that the current facility built in 1986, I think it was a little earlier than that, I thought, but um, be that as it may, um, is in dire need of rehabilitation and that was uh, another 35 million, was it 35 million? No, I don't know if it was 24. 24 to 25. I can always add. <laughs> <laughs> million here, million there. Um, yeah, kind of gets the Senate and done it. But <laughs> so there was a recognition also that you would need to put significant capital funds into a new Woodside. And I think there was, that's another consideration, frankly. It is worth discussing whether or not, in light of the short, short of money for the capital. I, I'm not on that committee, so I sent a representative members and Senator Hooker are much more familiar with <coughs> the capital needs of the state. But I think that's part of the issue. I agree. The, the investment I think is, is in the kids. Um, yep. So when we're looking at when we're looking at placements in and out of the state, uh, I know that our neighboring states, as you said, uh, are often not considered out of state placements due to proximity to their home. Uh, but we're not just sending kids to Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Uh, we've got Pennsylvania, Texas, Arkansas, Florida. These are places that, that while they, the programs themselves may be less secure than what Woodside is, uh, they are not less restricted by nature. Uh, when you're 2,000 miles away from home, where are you going to go? Um, who's going to come, you know, seeing your social worker on the last day of one month or the first day of the next month? To, to meet the uh, requirements of monthly check-ins uh, doesn't really provide support for our kids in, in, in state's custody. So when we're looking at uh, a family recently spent almost $10,000 out of their own pocket trying to get uh, their, their, their son to stay at Woodside so that they could be in, uh, incorporated and, and present for the, the therapy that needed, the family therapy, the family work that needed to happen, um, only to have them sent down to uh, Southern Massachusetts, which was again a, a traveling concern for that particular family. Um, so, understanding that sometimes the the proximity of the home is uh, is closer for a place like uh, Plymouth, New Hampshire, or, or Massachusetts. Uh, that's I understand that, but it's also not as frequent as the kids that are being placed other other 
Uh, first off, I'd like to just, uh, I saw a lot of faces last week from people that had come and visit Woodside. Um, some of you guys and gals uh, playing volleyball and uh, interacting with some of our residents as they, as you got tours. Um, it's nice to see. Uh, I, I, I want to just make sure that uh, I want to I wanna say, it, it, we have a great group of um, very highly skilled uh, individuals that work at Woodside. Our, our, um, our turnover, our staff turnover rate is probably, I don't know the exact number, but it's, it's very low. We have people that have built careers on learning how to treat trauma, and um, that's our goal. And um, uh, we have a, a, a staff that have, of, of ex experts. Um, and in the years that I've worked there, we, we've had a number of, of very significantly positive outcomes from uh, really getting, getting involved in, in treating that trauma work and doing that work with, with the clients that we serve. Um, as we do have to be mindful of our budget, I think um, we're losing, if, if, we, if we don't take a hard look at this, uh, th this group of, of experts that, we, that I work with, my colleagues, and see what we can do with these people, that, that's part of the budget is, is our, you know, what we do. And um, I don't want to lose sight in the fact that we have a group of people that um, have some of the best outcomes, 99 percentile um, from, from um, our colleagues across the nation uh, that we can, we can be proud of. And um, I, I don't want to lose sight of that because it's about treatment and it's about helping the, the young adults that we serve get better and we do that very well. Are there questions? Final thoughts or anything else? Uh, the, the one last thing that I would say is that the, um, the team at Woodside <coughs> collectively, uh, we see all this, uh, this it's, it's financially driven and it, uh, these motives for, for Woodside and understanding the budget and, and or not fully understanding the budget, obviously, uh, but understanding the budget obviously weighs into the impact of uh, what happens with our facility. Um, it's concerning uh, to see that that there's not a set plan in place. Um, I think when you're looking at us as employees of the state that are invested in the well-being of the kids, uh, it would be Probably a little easier to swallow, maybe a little easier to swallow these these uh, losing of our, our jobs and uh, closure of Woodside if there was a you know in place plan that was developed that was going to uh, to meet the needs of the kids to a, to a degree that exceeds what we currently do. And without that, it just seems like short sighted. I think the fact that they're, that they're not closing on December thirty first and instead talking about June 30th, I heard, yes, I heard that there was a conversation yesterday in, in House appropriations um, about even extending beyond that. So I'm not sure what that conversation was. Obviously, I wasn't there. So there, there, is, there is not a decision to close it tomorrow. It's, they're talking June 30th or even later. And I think a lot depends upon what the recommendations are and how this all goes. I mean, I, I realize we should be able to give you more answers. Well, I think the reality for me is just that the, the six million yeah, dollar the six million dollar number that we're looking at is for 2021. Um, whereas if if this plan doesn't work, uh, the cost to rebuild what we already currently have is going to far exceed six million dollars. Um, and I think that that, that needs uh, some. Money. Uh, just a, lastly, um, you know, we, we worked, you, you alluded to the fact that, and I remember the trips back and forth, um, we as in Woodside and our, our, our building has worked collaboratively with agencies in, through, the, through the state for years, and we've done so very, very well with positive outcomes, and you, you talked about the, the need for just a little bit of a, you know, uh, time to reflect and, 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 uh, and, and then get back into the community. We do a lot of community-based services right through our building. Um, we regularly take out, my, my job entitles, I take out kids out in the community regularly as they're 
able to um, and step them out um, in an incentive-based programming where we can help them uh, be able to be successful in the community again. Um, and, and that's critical in, in um, positive outcomes, meeting them where they're at. And, 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 and so that's, that's one of the things I want to, I want to just make that we do. The services that we provide, uh, even though we are in, an, in a building, we do uh, quite a few services outside of our building with our, with our youth. I can remember you driving down the building. Many times. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I guess you know, it's, these decisions are never easy, and they're not involved in one person. And I'm, I'm, I'm very I don't nervous. think they're necessarily the reflection of, of lots of faith in the staff on the side, but more of a question about a lot of other things. And, and I'm very proud of our, our department for taking a hard look and saying how we can make things better. I just want to lose sight that we have some of the best. That my colleagues are some experts in the field. We, we've we helped some of the toughest cases get better. I hope if we've done nothing else this morning, it's at least to clarify Thank some you. of the challenges ahead for both you and the field. Um, I really appreciate your coming here this morning and talking to us. Uh, it's very helpful. Thank Steve, you. Steve, thanks for putting it together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, like you say with a kid, never, never do that. <laughs> and uh, I think you made up a sheet that you been handed out to us yesterday. Uh, it's got the pie chart on it. And it points out several of the problems that Vermont's having uh, with reentry housing. The title of it is The Current Availability of Reentry Housing Does Not Match the Needs of People Assessment. So, um, they looked at various populations. All the check marks of what we're doing right and all the X's are where we need to do better. And on uh, this chart, we're seeing up a lot of X's. So the, the subject of this discussion is the additional housing update. And we're hoping that Dale and the others could give us a, a little idea of what we've got now and where we're headed. Um, and I like the color coding. <laughs> but, um, and I also, have, we're going to hear from, you'll see one of the things on the back page is of what they're doing right with the check mark. Or it's housing significant pre entry. Um, or no, it's on the front. Uh, talks about Vermont has pioneered certain housing options, including pathways, housing first model. So we have folks from pathways here to talk about that as well. So uh, that's, that's the agenda right for the next hour. So I think we're starting out with Dale, and he may introduce some help. Yeah. With help. And uh, we wanted an inventory of what we've got now. But again, this, this chart shows um, 230 people past their minimum. 38% with programming issues, 26% lack housing, 24% hold security safety, 6% plan to max out, and 6% unknown. So we're talking about around, I don't know, 38% of the, or 50, a large percentage of the group of 230 are housing issues either lack housing or programming issues related to. So I'm going to talk to you sorry. Uh, I'm Bill Brook, uh, Director of Field Services and Lock County Corrections. Yep. I'm Elizabeth Whitmore, Housing Administrator with Corrections. Dara Viadamo, Community and Restorative Justice Executive, Department of Corrections. Great. I don't have the sheet that you guys are referring to. Okay, well. We have an extra one from. I think there's some over by Senator Baru. Are there extra sheets? I don't Here. No more. I think it's in our lines. Yeah. That's the, I mean, it's just a chart and it talks about various, well, you know, we don't have. So those are the anyway, issues. Anyway, it's just a chart that I thought was helpful for the committee to have on the housing issue that we're discussing. 
But please go ahead with your inventory of where we're at today. All right, so um, uh, I'll let Derek speak for most of this because he has most of the knowledge. We do have a, a network of both scattered and uh, country housing throughout the state. Um, uh, I believe uh, one of the attachments that I handed out has all the individual listings that we have uh, situated throughout the state, um, kind of the information about those uh, housing programs. Um, Sure, I'd be happy to just sort of give uh, uh, a quick run through of the handout that we provided. Happy to pause at any moment where there's questions for clarification and have plenty of time. I want to clarify the chart. It says about 60 people are being held that past their minimum with housing issues. 60 people? 60. That's what the chart would say, 28%. 26% lack of housing is about 60 people. Okay. Programming issues for 38. Why are these people past their minimum date? 230 individuals. So when I was talking about that, it looks like around 60 people that are being held that have housing issues. I think there might be more. That, I don't have there may be more because of the furlough and the other chart. Anyway. Please go ahead with what you want. Sure, and, and I think as we work down the great questions that the committee asked us to speak to uh, a little later in our data presentation, uh, we, we get at some of the complexities that account for that number. Um, in corrections parlance, we sometimes refer to that internally as the B1 list, so apologies in advance. <laughs> if we slip into that kind of internal Coding. It's not meant to obfuscate anything. It's simply the, uh, the database that we originally used that categorized folks whose primary barrier to release upon reaching their minimum sentence was lack of housing. Um, and so if this works for folks, I'll just take us, walk us through this, but by all means, the colleagues will also um, chime in. Um, we'll take questions as we come. And, um, Acknowledging that we're happy to share this time with our uh, our close collaborators and colleagues from Pathways as two. Which one are we talking from first? So, um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't have that. Do you have? Do you have? Yeah, that's it. We have two things. Yeah. yeah, the one that says on the top, Department of Corrections and Transition Housing, this is an inventory. This is yep. our current, okay, that's the uh, current master list of DOC funded transitional housing programs, where they're located, the number of beds. So this gives you a statewide picture in this current uh, fiscal year of what DOC procures in the way of transitional housing. The second sheet really takes us into what are we getting and what are we understanding from those investments. So, are folks uh, sufficiently oriented to have me walk you through <coughs> this one? Great. And by all means, um, you know, flag us at any time. So, the first, uh, first piece that we addressed uh, as per the committee's questions were, um, the current use, or what we sometimes refer to as utilization, okay? <clears throat> Both types. The language that the legislature used was supervised or unsupervised, as Dale said, we often think of that in terms of congregate housing settings or scattered site. So for example, a congregate housing setting would be a physical brick and mortar structure, such as a dismiss house, for example, and I think we've got colleagues from uh, dismiss house, Richard Gandhi, I believe I saw. Um, where DOC grants for a number of beds, not necessarily all the beds in that house, but there's a physical brick and mortar structure, it's congregate, there's multiple folks reside in that same residence, and it's staffed. And so that's what I think the legislature's intent was by calling that supervised. I mention this just because all the folks for whom DOC transitional housing monies go to are supervised by the Department of Corrections, just to establish that. Unsupervised would be our scattered site model, so apartments where we provide rental assistance and the uh, organization uh, uh, provides other additional supportive services but doesn't provide necessarily on-site supervision of the individuals. And again, 
uh, and we will hear from our Pathways colleagues uh, who use that model in a broader housing, housing first context. So um, when we look at utilization, that's just a function of how many beds are we procuring and how often are those beds occupied, whether it be one person or four person people or 10 people in the program. And then we aggregate that, and that's an average. So if we look at this current fiscal year that we're in, um, beginning July 1 of 2019, um, through September 30, we, we do our data captures on a quarterly basis. Um, we see that across all programs, and again, that's this master inventory, um, the utilization rate, the usage rate is 72%, um, which um, we've set an internal target of 80%. If you're wondering why wouldn't we just try to hit 100%, right? It's unrealistic. There's so much movement inflow and outflow of transitional housing programs, people who uh, fortunately um, succeed and move on to permanence, but we don't know exactly what day that might happen, nor do we necessarily know what exactly somebody might have to be exited from a program. It would literally be impossible to achieve uh, 100%, or frankly, probably even 90% uh, utilization. There's just so many, you know, in the now. So we've set a benchmark of 80% by which we internally feel like that's a solid measure of the return on investment of state funds relative to utilization. And so we've been averaging uh, a little below that 72%, which from a percentage differential is just 10% um, off. And uh, as you'll see, that fluctuates each quarter. Um, there's variability in individual circumstances. Uh, and the number of individuals scheduled for release. So, for example, there might be programs right now where if we were to take a snapshot, we'd say, hmm, utilization looks pretty low. Utilization looks like it might be 50% at this moment. But when we project out eight weeks from now, in fact, we've got several individuals that might be slated to go to any of these programs, um, which will bring that utilization high. Another thing just to mention is economies of scale. Some of these programs are very small we might have four beds in the program. So it may be misleading to, um, without knowing the economy of scale, the end variable to think, oh, 25% or 50% utilization, when in fact one other person could in fact uh, you know, bring that, uh, you know, effectively double uh, those utilization rates. So I'll pause just on utilization, see if there's any questions on that. So I'm confused sure. as far as um, the percentage. And if we're looking at people who are past their minimum, why aren't they filling those rooms? OK, so <laughs> we will drop down to that so very shortly, understanding that that really is the key, key question. <laughs> we use an RDA, a results-based accountability framework, for measuring, um, again, the sort of return on investment of taxpayer dollars for housing. The uh, results-based accountability framework, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, looks at three domains of performance. How much? Um, so in other words, just sort of like, what's the volume of service that's being provided? Um, which is, of course, very important, and we'll always attend to that. But we also have developed collaboratively with our housing providers a set of measures that um, determine how well, what's the quality of the service? So these aren't just widgets. These aren't just units of service provision and service receiving. These are humans who live uh, full uh, lives and the services that they receive should honor the, you know, their wholeness. So again, we work collectively with our service providers, a committee that uh, uh, our grantees opted into to develop how well measures as well as better off. So what do we know when folks exit program and why? And so there you'll see our data around that. We have our targets on the left of the um, columns there, and then the actuals. And this is, again, across all programs. And um, this, this is also pertaining to the first quarter of FY20. Yes. Um, so um, as you'll see, we've served, um, actually, we've exceeded the number of individuals served based on the target. Um, already. That can be complex, though. I think if there's anything I want the, this committee to understand is that this is complicated. And just by way of a quick example, on one hand, 
at face value, it may look like a very positive thing that we've served more people than our target. Okay? Right? We want X number of people served and we've exceeded that. However, when we dig into the data, we have to be understanding why it is, what accounts for that. Did we serve more people because more people cycled in and out of these programs and left these programs for non-ideal reasons? And I think it's fair to say we see a mixture uh, of that. So on one hand, I think we've got great efficiencies that are represented in that um, individual serve, but we're also seeing what we might refer to as churn. And we will pick up on that because that corrects, connects directly to what accounts for why if we have all this housing, do we still have people um, sitting beyond minimum? So um, if we drop down to the program type, we break out that utilization to look at of the uh, supervised or congregate and the scattered type. And we see a difference. We see that the utilization on average in those congregate sites is lower. And we have what we believe are some data-driven insights as to what accounts for that. Um, and why, conversely, when we look at the scattered site model, such as the housing first model, practiced by, our, by pathways um, um, on, we do see um, increased utilization. Um, I'll actually speak to uh, Liz. Would you like to care to speak a little of that right now? Yeah, I mean, I think part of why we're seeing utilization higher in a scattered site model is that folks have a little more wiggle room. So when you're in a house with 10 or 20 people, the programs have to be a little more strict with the rules to, to cover the integrity of the program. Whereas if you're in your own place and you're struggling, um, everyone can work with you a little longer to make sure you get on your feet. So we see people asked to leave the congregate sites earlier maybe than they would be if they were in their own place because it's really about the, the quality of the whole program in the community. And I think another, another way of just languaging that framework is that the individualized structures whereby someone's in their own apartment allow for the application of a harm reduction framework relative to that individual's health and the risk that they present to public safety which is corrections responsibility. Whereas the congregate settings, because of the broader issues of collective responsibility and liability, work somewhat against the values of harm reduction. They don't have the opportunity to apply as situational and individualistic responses with folks who are in a phase of relapse in their recovery because that person's relapse will have immediate ramifications on the safety and the sobriety, potentially, of the other residents in those kind of get housing. Corrections has really established itself, in my opinion, Dale, please correct me, as at the forefront of using a harm reduction-driven approach to um, field supervision. We really reserve incarceration for folks who are presenting an active and persistent risk to public safety. So we no longer are um, keen in any respect to relodge someone whose behavior we feel can be managed safely in the community. Sometimes that creates a bit of a discrepancy between what those kind of housing sites are equipped to do. It's not a judgment of the performance or the quality of those programs. It's just the co-occurring and sometimes competing paradigms by which programs need to look out for the uh, therapeutic, therapeutic milieu of that entire program and corrections is able to work in an individual modality with each individual, which I think we should feel really proud about as a state. Can you so, me, just so I understand what we're talking about, if I look at um, pathways vary yes. 20 annually, does that mean that they have 20 corrections or does it mean they have total 20 beds? Corrections folks, they should say. Just corrections. So yes. pathways may have 40 beds in Barry, but 20 of them are for corrections. Correct. Path pathways. When, but, when it says annually, what does that mean? That means over the course of one fiscal year, the funds that we award to pathways will 
provide services to 20 individuals okay. as referred by DOC and as accepted. Um, for, yeah, yeah. So again, Barry, because it's on the first page, Phoenix House 14. So, um, and so does that mean that that's annually or is that 14 beds, whether they're filled or not? That means for, we are paying currently under our current model, we are paying for um, that provider, in this case, Phoenix House, to make 14 beds available. Yeah whether or not we utilize them, and that is reflected in those utilization stats. Okay. So where we see a low stat, that reflects the differential between how much we've procured, 14 beds, and let's just say, for example, for the myriad reasons that we'll drop down into, we've only provided seven folks to be served, we'd see obviously a 50% utilization rate. In that scenario. Thank you for that. Yeah. So. Just a clarification. Yeah, absolutely. So I think right, the question, so now, the question is, is like, what what accounts for uh, why we would have folks pass their minimum? Again, we call that the B one list, and then still have empty beds in some of these programs. Yep. Right. That's the question. And that's a question that we are constantly data mining for, and we've shared some insights into this. Um, and so I'm looking at the part of our report that says estimated number of inmates who could be released to transition out, transitional housing were available. Okay? And I, I, I think the, there are several important things to, to recognize uh, and for us all to, to move forward with a shared understanding. Of. The complexities of the population who are held beyond their minimum sentence primarily due to lack of housing. In other words, if they had approved housing, they could and would be released. Um, this is a complex population, okay? So it makes the fundamental premise of the question a hard one to answer. What do I mean by that, okay? I mean in plain, simple English, it's not just a lack of housing that is preventing us from putting those people out. And on any given day, if we put them out to the empty spots in the existing programs, they would not likely succeed. How do we know this? Because many of the folks who sit on that B1 list, in fact, have had multiple episodes of release to transitional housing programs and made their way back to incarceration, and not simply just because of lack of housing but recommission of new offenses. So, so what the B1 list essentially is, it's a coding that we use for classification for our facilities about this individual, we're not holding them for anything other than a, a residence. Does it mean they're very compliant with supervision? A lot of times they've gone out, they've violated conditions of supervision, they've been returned. We're not holding them on the violation, we're holding them on the fact that they lost their residence and as soon as they can find a residence, we release them. A lot of other systems don't have that mechanism. Um, like a straight parole system, they would get their parole revoked, they'd have to go back before the board at some point to get their parole. For us in Vermont, once the residence becomes available, we can release them immediately. Um, so it's not really that they're there for a lack of residence. It's, they're there for like a residence, but it's not because they haven't had opportunities to be out in the community. Um, uh, again, they are a very complex grouping, um, and we do do a lot of churn with the B1 population. But, um, Thank you for that confusion. <laughs> <laughs> so, of the 126 people held past their minimum sentence, primarily due to a lack of housing. So again, that's the main barrier keeping us from releasing them. 74, which is just shy of 60%, have participated in DOC funding transitional housing on one or more occasion, right? And at least half of the remaining 52 out of that 126, so at least half, at least 26 of them, have been referred to DOC funded transitional housing programs and denied because they, we already knew their needs were too high or they've been placed on a waiting list. So that, um, we, we have some programs that are, equipped and set up to deal with the most complicated cases. But we don't have sufficient capacity statewide 
in those types of programs. And if our data points towards the housing first model as the leading practice that gets folks with complex and co-occurring needs into housing and stabilizes them such that other supportive services, mental health can be brought to bear and they can be supervised in the community. So where we do have a waiting list for beds and we don't have statewide coverage for these types of beds is with our Pathways grant. And uh, I believe it's my opinion that that's a function of the broader housing first model practiced by Pathways. Um, which aligns well with the complexities of the population and the housing needs and the economic liability represented by failing to address both of those in a integrated model. Okay, so, so in <laughs> simpler language, you need more of these highly Complex yeah, we're events. spending more money on folks who the data doesn't suggest the programs we're putting them to are as likely to be aligned. I, 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 would not, I do not mean to characterize this in black and white terms, but when we look at performance, we definitely see um, better outcomes in aggregate in terms of utilization of this service, which is a function of stability of the population in the community in connection with that. So, um, and, and a lot of that has to do with folks convicted for sexual offenses. Yeah. That is a hard population to entice the <coughs> private landlord market to be willing to open up the assets that they are in possession of in terms of apartments and place folks who are generally marginalized by virtue of their past behavior and whatever combination of facts and myth may surround the understanding of that behavior. And so Pathways, for example, has a team dedicated to just managing relationships with the landlords so as to mitigate the perceived and real risk associated with placing that very hard to house population. I hope I'm not mischaracterizing the work that my colleagues and families do. But this is what our understanding, both in working in close connection with our grantees and what we see the data bears. All right, so I'm just totally confused by your charts. Okay. Let me help. How can we clarify? I don't know if you can. But if I look at this chart with color, color, and I look at it says that 98% of the of the 377 people, is that correct? Not 377 people were actually served. How much? How well? 81% of the 377 were accepted. No. no. So 81% of all referrals were accepted. 377 were actually served. So probably whatever, 19% okay, so more. 377 was yeah. served. Of the 377 that were served, 98% were not charged with a new crime. That's a health of a success rate, right? Mm -hmm. yes. while, while, while in that program. While in that program. So only 2% of the 377 were charged with a new crime. What percentage will return to jail for technical violations? That's not here, and I want to. Ask, what is that number? I think we could we could assume we don't know for sure that it's probably sixty-five percent when you look at the thirty-five. Well, that's what I'm wondering yeah. about because that's what. So if, if mm -hmm. so if if only two percent are charged with a new crime, why are only thirty percent? 5% exiting to permanent housing, and presumably a great number of these people are sent back to jail on technical violations, right? Yes. Am, I, am I making sense no, now? So, okay. so a lot of, so the scattered sites don't have... So are we overdoing technical violations? That's my question. 
Um, a lot of the reason is the program themselves. So um, some of the housing are abstinence only. So any drug use, any alcohol use, they have a lot of rules. If they violate those rules, they are removed from that program. Um, and then at that point, they lose their housing and the department responds to the lack of housing through, through a technical violation. You don't have to fund those programs, do we? We are looking at aligning our criteria for funding with one that does not uh, use a zero tolerance policy. And that would probably be something we reflect in a future round of uh, RFPs. Um. And I would say the biggest reason folks are asked to leave, at least the congregate sites, is for substance use. So they dirty urine. Yeah. Right. In some of these, in some of the congregate yeah. programs, not all, but some. And some of that is a function of broader policy of the organization that runs that program, which is not necessarily, although it is often, um, uh, a Vermont based agency, but some, but that's not necessarily the case. So we get into broader organizational policy. But you can understand that. You know, a, a housing group that has 10 individuals and one is using, the other nine are at risk. So they're thinking of the collective and not the individual. Well, I, I want to just understand something in that. We had this discussion here last time we met was regarding the work camp. Um, it was an informal discussion, I think. And the 50 beds that are not being utilized at St. Johnsbury. And St. Johnsbury saying, well, we don't want sex offenders. We don't want them if, if they're not from Caledonia County. Um, and we don't want this, we don't want that in the, in the other 50 beds. <laughs> so they're determining who would be populating. And you may not have that population to populate. <laughs> are other service providers in this group doing the same thing. So in other words, you're contracting with people that want people that aren't, that you don't have. So, I don't know if that makes sense. Well, if you look, a lot of them don't accept sex offenders. So we put out proposals, um, and, and we can only respond to who responds back to our proposal. Understood. But it, the question makes great sense. I, if, okay. if I may, I think what this um, shines a, a spotlight on, and I'm, I, I would imagine the committee sees this in multiple, multiple respects, is that some of the fundamental constructs of how these things get funded are built on premises that silo um, a set of integrated and complex problems. So for example, um, there may be some interplay between somebody's substance use disorder and their risk for um, criminal activity. However, You've got multiple corrections funds looks to try to move people out of prison to sort of decarcerate whenever possible and put them into programs that do try to address substance use disorders, but in relatively short time frames with no, uh, again, no tolerance for relapse. So I think the, I think the into, Interactivity of the different challenges would best be reflected through braided funding across the different departments in AHS, such that we would have program models that better mirror the various um, institutional relationships that individuals have with ADAP, with DMH, with corrections. So on some level, I would agree that there's, there's a mismatch between corrections, grantees, when it comes to the complex substance use disorder population, and have the, the programs that we are able to grant to, given the, con the supervision context, in which we want to keep them in the community. We don't want them to leave the community. Right. The other category, the sex offenders, if you will, I think that's a function of just not enough. So we've got a mismatch when it comes to the substance use disorder population and a paucity when it comes to the sexual offender Because I'm being taped and because I'm, you know, in this position, I have to be careful how I put this. 
but not all sex offenders are equally dangerous in their release. And that's part of the problem is we should look at what is the risk level of that sex offender in determining what the programming should be. And I think that's what fails here is that, and that's part of a, obviously a, an issue well beyond corrections in terms of public perception of all sex offenders. We should be doing more on to talking about the risk of a certain sex offender. Maybe actually the sex offender who's being released who's done to treatment is much less likely to reoffend than somebody with a history of um, counterfeiting. Absolutely. I mean, our sex offenders have gone through our programs um, and they've released that have appropriate residences. A lot of them are pro-social, they can go out and get jobs. They're not dealing with addiction issues, they're not dealing with other issues of criminality they're dealing with. But they're labeled as uh, sex offenders, which is, uh, yeah. and, and so, I mean, I think that's a societal issue, and, a, and I, uh, but it's unfortunate that some, po some part of your population <coughs> that you can't place in the community is because of the nature of your crime. Not, not based on their risk level. Or the nature of the general willingness of, again, sort of the private well, landlord yeah. population. Well, but not, a, not just the private, but I'll throw again, I don't, I don't live anywhere near Caledonia County. Mm -hmm. But if Caledonia, if St. Johnsbury's community can say, no sex offenders if they're not from Caledonia County, allowed in this supervised program by the Department of Corrections, Yep. They're, they're, no matter what the risk level is of that yeah. sex offender, mm -hmm. you can't go there. They're still paying. So I, I you know. Yes. And, and unless you've got 50 sex offenders from Caledonia County, I feel. So I'm uh, clearly aware of what our colleagues have time, but I, yeah. uh, I think the complexity, and it's not intended to be confusing to us, it's not confusing, however, it is complex. Mm -hmm. And so. Hopefully, well, this has established the complexity, but removed some of the confusion behind it. You know, I, I sat down with a reformer from New York City who um, was at Bennington College, and they were talking about women at Rikers Island, and their goal is to get all the women out of Rikers Island. Well, Rikers Island is being completely decommissioned. Why not? Yeah. Their goal is where, where do you put the women? Right. Okay. So their goal is to put them in housing that is much more suitable. And uh, anyway, and we got talking about Vermont, and then she said, how many people have passed their minimum? I said, around 200. She said, well, there's your out-of-state population. Let everybody out and pass their minimum, and you don't have a problem anymore. <laughs> so I, and these are experts. So I would just let you know that the solution is there. Just let those 230 people out there pass their minimum. Right. Therefore, you would not have people out of state. Yeah. Yeah. I would encourage us all to, yeah. when we have... So would you like that simple solution? <laughs> That's a simple one. Yes, sir. Because <laughs> uh, 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 come but, but I think I, I, I would leave our testimony with um, our, the, the recognition that when we look at the transactions of transitional housing. We don't just ask the what and the how many, but the who. Because when we dig into the who and who is in prison past their minimum for lack of housing, we get a much more textured, much more realistic, much more complicated picture. But that picture accounts for what at face value may look like. Why would it be that we have empty beds in the community and over full you know, prison beds or people who are staying beyond their minimum? And so I, I, I would just humbly submit that we drop down into that much more textured level to understand the humans who are trying to safely supervise in the community and house, and who uh, corrections data suggests that we can, um, but these other impediments uh, and uh, capacities well, need to better align with our ability to manifest understood. our policies. You only have a 
additional crime, new crime. Well, well, keep in mind, that that's, a folks, that a, that's that a folks who remain in the program. So when you take out the folks who used and got kicked out of one program or didn't oh. get into a program, that is a subset of the folks uh, who are abiding you're by. The, you're so, the whole program. Sorry. So, so not, not that we're not proud of our programs and they're not performing well, but you're, you're essentially looking at a subset a sub cohort of the folks who are already able to thread many of those needles to get themselves into those programs <coughs> and stay in those programs. Thank you. Okay, just just question one question. question. Um, uh, on your chart, um, um, individuals have 11. What, what, who are these? So we have some programs that, that um, offer different services. So some are a house with beds, some are a scattered site model like Pathways where they're paying for the rent in a private apartment. And then we also have a couple grants that do housing search and retention work. So they're uh, looking for uh, apartments in the community, connecting with landlords. And so some of our grants have that to look for. Our funding goes to the somebody on the community-based organization side whose job is to do that. We've had um, we've had some success with that in some in some areas. And to kind of follow up on, on your statement, Senator Sears. Um, housing is a very important factor in successfulness of our offenders. Because uh, I remember when uh, 808 H at the time F came about about the lack of housing, um, we did a lot of uh, data mining and research on that, and the folks that were released without housing violated, picked up new charges at a much higher rate than a higher risk population that was released in appropriate residence. Um, so, so we try to be mindful of that, not just open the doors and um, let them out, because a lot of times it, it will. Um, Representative Shaw. Well, thank you. My question. No, that's fine. I, I will do, be seeing Derek in a few weeks, a couple, three weeks, and anyway, I'm sure as well. Ask the questions there, but I'd like to just put both some comment. It wasn't that long ago when we had 270 or so people. Our uh, uh, Health has to admit we're down to somewhere around 100. It's, it's, it's around 125. So we're, we're, we've made some substantial process. This says 230. That combines other folks. Yeah, the strength of for B1 lack of housing is yeah. 121. That's right. B1 indicates the primary barrier is the housing oh, piece. There's other people passing in because they're in programming, they well, as I said, using programming, they picked up the DRs. So like but, yeah. but again, I will point to the, the solution to the, from many people, is anybody pass their minutes should be released unless there's a good reason not to. I guess you don't want to set them up for a failure. That would be the argument. Okay. It's not that it's from a house, from a housing grant program, like we manage I manage essentially a mutual fund of investments for housing. From our perspective, it's not a function of we wouldn't want those people out to set them up for failure. It's just that the particular programs that we've procured would, are, are, are mismatched. If those individuals had the means to live independently, um, I think that we, you know, there'd be no opinion from that, from a transitional housing perspective, as to whether or not that would be a wise decision or not. We just have, you know, what we've procured and the population we have and the challenges of optimizing for that match with the population that has changed, as we know, over the last 15 years at least. So I'm going to ask a real stupid question. No, it won't be stupid. I think I know the answer, but I just can't ask the question. <laughs> Presumptive parole would be at your min. So now at your min, you would be furloughed out. And that's where we get into those technical violations of Fur Louise, and then they come back. We did something like presumptive parole at your men. We would be presumed to be paroled, but for. And then DOC has to prove the but for. Flips the pattern. So then the onus would be on the parole board 
to really work through where does that person go. They qualify for parole because they've met their men, they've played by the rules while they were incarcerated. So then it's really the parole board that would then have to work through the housing issues, the programming issues, and not DOC. Correct? I'll definitely defer to Dale as the uh, field services director on that. I'm, I'm the housing person, not I the general service. Yeah, generally, with, with productive parole, it's, it's unknown at this time because we haven't had it. So what is a... Uh, the release mechanism look like for presumptive parole? Do they have to have an appropriate residence? Is it just once they meet certain criteria, out they go and they have to figure out after they're already paroled? So there's a lot of questions. It's not, that's, that's, I think Derek said, it's very complicated and throwing presumptive parole in it just has another layer of complexity. Um, you know, this population that utilizes these services, the easy way to understand it, these are individuals where parents don't want to supply them anymore. Friends and families, they, I mean, we call them uh, uh, bridge burners. They, they've really, they've gone through a myriad of options. I mean, very few are there for just poverty reasons where they haven't had any opportunities, they don't know anyone, they can't get out. Um, a lot of it is they've had multiple opportunities and multiple uh, resources that they have are no longer want to supply resources to them. Um, so this is really, I mean, this is the population that, that this is, the, these services are trying to address. I mean, really complicated, um, either through addiction, through trauma, through violence, through mental health issues. Um, I mean, it, it is a, a myriad of individuals that we're trying to, to basically address housing with. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Did you want to hear from Pat? Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Dollars. Okay, well, thank you for inviting us. Uh, my name is Patrick Gallagher. I'm the development director at Pathways Vermont. Uh, this is Lindsay Mesa. Uh, she's our program director for Housing First. Um, and I guess we're here to uh, give you some detail about our Housing First program, particularly to our Department of Corrections population that we work with. Um, and answer any questions you might have. Uh, about our program, how it works, what our availabilities look like, and, and where we're available and where we're not currently um, through the funding research. Um, so our Housing First model, I'll keep it that brief, is, I don't know how much you know about Housing First, but we, we work with folks with zero, we provide zero barriers to housing. So we work to get people into scatter set apartments uh, around the state. Um, and then provide services once um, they are housed. Um, so particularly to our Department of Corrections program, we work with um, anyone that's referred to us by the Department of Corrections, if we have an availability. Um, we utilize a, a, a practice a harm reduction model, um, as we've spoken about earlier. Um, so we don't have um, requirements for sobriety, um, or no drug use um, in an apartment. What we do require is that someone abides by the rules of the lease, just like anyone else. Um, so we have independent, um, an independent housing team that works with landlords uh, in every community we work with to identify housing um, and then work with that landlord and the, the tenant individually to get them moved in. And then we have a specialized team um, that uh, works with folks on their self-identified goals. Um, to it. And so each individual person, we have a tailored service plan. Is it voluntary? It's. <laughs> would you describe it as voluntary? Is it voluntary? Oh, yes. Yeah, all of our services are, vo are voluntary. Yes. It's, it's voluntary. If they want to work with us, we'll work with them. Yeah. That way. Yeah. But if they're in corrections and they want to leave the jail, then they kind of have to say yes. So. Uh, uh, our colleagues at Corrections can speak better to this, but uh, essentially the way that it operates is that referrals are made to our program that are screened by the district manager. And those referrals are, um, you know, the typically folks in Corrections, the casework staff in Corrections working with the offender to determine, you know, what's your, what's your best option, right, for uh, a sustainable housing plan once you've reached your minimum and you're eligible well, for release. If Mary Jones is that the Chittenden Correctional Facility and needs a placement in Brattleboro, then they work with the Brattleboro? 
So they would work. Or they work with That's right. Pathways Vermont. I mean, I'm yeah. confused about who's working with Mary. Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, uh, maybe and, you and can explain so, to us yeah. who's so, working with Mary to get Mary out of Chittenden. So typically the casework staff would be working with Mary in Chittenden to determine where she might go when she's eligible for release. Right. But as you're alluding to, people typically return to their, the place where they committed their crime, right? Where, they, where their residence was <coughs> for supervision, for field supervision. So if Mary's going to be field supervised in Brattleboro, she would be referred to our Brattleboro-based Department of Corrections team. We're a statewide organization. Uh, we currently operate our corrections program in five counties in the state. Uh, that's in Franklin County, Addison County, Washington County, Chittenden County, and Winder, Windham County currently. So we want to be in all 11 uh, probation and uh, parole office districts that we're currently due to funding constraints just in those five communities. But Mary has now been referred to Pathways, what happens? Yep, so she would be, um, she, the, the referral system is through the funder management uh, system, so the electronic database that the Department of Corrections uses, and she would be uh, referred, and that referral would go to the district manager uh, in the probation and parole office or an assigned person in a local probation and parole office for initial screening. And that um, probation and parole office is really looking at, okay, is this you know, an appropriate referral based on everyone we're supporting in the community right now? Does this make sense? And they give it a thumbs up and then it comes to us. And then uh, typically, um, we, with the kind of Scott has Scott subscribed, we have really few barriers to accepting people into our program. We'll accept if we have capacity um, or we'll wait list if we're currently at capacity in the community. Are you seeing it more difficult to house women than males or males than females coming out of college? Are you seeing a difference there at all? No, I wouldn't say there's a, a dramatic difference based on uh, just someone's sex or gender. Um, we do have uh, some housing stock that we keep in the community, so we do all independent uh, apartments with mostly private landlords. The, the Department of Corrections funding, we have a little over a million dollars of funding um, from the Department of Corrections. It funds both our services as well as we're the pass-through for rental assistance uh, on those units. So we um, see the biggest challenge in terms of just what people's offense types might be and also what their uh, tenancy histories look like mm -hmm. uh, in terms of finding the right fit for unit. But one of the benefits to uh, using the scatter site model is that we do, we can look for housing that's really individualized for that person's needs. So if somebody has certain restrictions uh, imposed by the Department of Corrections on where they could live or what kind of amenities they need in their housing, we can look for housing that's appropriate for that individual, which allows us to serve um, a bit of a different population than uh, some other programs can. We uh, have some stats from last fiscal year. Uh, over 82% um, of our population served last fiscal year had either a moderate, high, or very high uh, ORIS score, so a risk assessment score. So we're um, serving a population of people who uh, are at high, you know, higher risk potentially to commit uh, additional crimes. 89% uh, had a violent crime. About a fifth of our population uh, were people with sexual offenses. Uh, and we believe that part of the reason that we're able to be really uh, highly effective with folks that have uh, challenging criminal histories is because of this very individualized support plan. Mm -hmm. Butch, thanks. Mm -hmm. So we heard from DOC that the Scattered Sites program is, is a really good program for them. It has a pretty high utilization rate. Yeah. Uh, but I'm from Roman County. Mm -hmm. and, uh, a little bit concerned that uh, you're only serving five counties statewide. So, mm -hmm. can you comment on that? Why a why you're not in Roman County, and b what the impediments do you have in all four counties? Yeah, I think um, we, as Lindsay said, we um, one of our values is that we believe that these services should be available statewide. Um, our constraints are budgetary um, at the state level, uh, so we would love to be able to provide these services in Rutland and Bennington County and Northeast Kingdom. Um, the, the service, the funding isn't there currently. Um, 
like I said, we would love to be able to, to serve that so population. So I understand why you're in the county. It's most of this county has more opportunities for folks. Yeah. Why Windsor and not many? Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, it's it's just been based on the request for proposals process that the uh, DOC folks were alluding to. So uh, for us, you know, um, our limitation to getting into a community is the funding to support a team and rental assistance and all those things there. And uh, we've grown throughout the state. We we started we've been in the, uh, the state for just about ten years, and we've partnered with the Department of Corrections for about ten years. When we started, we were in just Chittenden County, and then we've grown to five counties in our DOC program, six counties in our permanent supportive housing Department of Mental Health funded programs, and we've done that by oh, just applying for funding as it's available. Mental, I'm sorry, mental health in six counties? Yes. Yes, that's so right. What's the, six, what's the county that doesn't have corrections but has mental health? It's, it's Windsor sure. County. Uh, so, and we have been um, approached by the district managers of Springfield Probation and Parole several times over the years, expressing interest in having us in that community. We've been approached by Bennington. Um, we've had some conversations with Rutland. Uh, and again, it's just been based on where the funding So is. the, I guess I'm understanding your own limitation <coughs> being statewide is, is funded. Exactly. Uh, and your, we, your, your organization we, um, has to get capacity to expand. If the funding was there, we would expand. We absolutely yes. Yeah, and we've demonstrated our ability to do that by going from one community to six and growing our population. When we first started, we uh, were tasked with serving 40 people out of homelessness. At this point, you're... we've supported over 700 people into the community. So I think we have developed a model that's uh, scalable, and uh, it's just about resource, financial resource. When you say you're in Wyndham County, does that mean the whole county, or does that mean just Brattleboro? That's the whole county, yes. So if, if somebody needed to be in Bellows Falls, they could, and somebody needed to be in Bloomington, they could. Yes. Who do you contract out with in Wyndham County? Is it the Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust, or is it? It's private uh, landlords. It's uh, private landlords. Yes. Exactly. exactly. The ones, yeah. the pathways that you have down in Wyndham County. Yeah, it's, it's private. We do, we do some work with the Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust, uh, but for our Department of Corrections program, we're primarily working with private landlords, you know, on the top shops, uh, with independent, you know, one bedroom units in the community that we provide the rental assistance for, and our tenants, when they have income, they uh, contribute 30% of their income towards their rent, uh, mirroring what Section E and other subsidized housing programs. So it's like, it's a, uh, oh. <laughs> um, you mentioned your capacity. So what is your capacity in the, in the counties that you're yeah, so we are funded to support a minimum of 62 people across the state in our Department of Corrections program. And I can give you the breakdown across the state right now. And we actually have that. You've got it. Okay. Would you like me to repeat it? Okay. Um, if, if you'd like, I'd have to repeat it. We have to go to the different counties yeah. to see pathways. For example, Chittenden, I believe, pathways. It's 20 in Chittenden and Washington, 20 each. It's eight in Franklin County, four in Madison County, and ten in Windham County. Uh, Just for context, I was on the uh, Economic Development and Housing Committee for a number of years. Mm -hmm. Five or six years ago, um, Housing First came in. Kevin Mullen was the chair, and he asked right. the exact same question: When will you expand into Rutland County? And got a very hopeful answer, yeah. but clearly the, the funding has not. Uh, We've had what? some proposals uh, at, uh, over the past couple of years uh, yeah. at the state have been run to you know to various places, um, but yeah, it just hasn't hasn't happened for us. But, yeah. mm -hmm. but there are you know if you total up Rockland County, there's a lot of housing provided. This was for homeless prevention center nine. Graham Shelter 3, Achievement Center, Mandela House 8, 12 in Vermont, Achievement Center Sanctuary House. So there's quite a few uh, housing options in Rutland. Yeah, I think there are options. What we are what we specialize in, right, is, is, is working with those folks that those other programs don't. Uh, yeah, no, I hear you. I, yeah. What I'm saying is, though, that the department is contract 
you know, maybe one of the reasons they're not in Bennington then is because the department contracts with Sea Off. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe one of the reasons you're not in Rutland is because the department's chosen to contract with um, the Achievement Center for 20 beds. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just suggesting. Yeah. Also, you're really dependent on landlords coming forward. Yeah. And I can see that being a real problem in yeah. some communities. We've actually, so I used to run our housing team. Um, and what we've proven over 10 years is that we really can specialize in, um, in those landlord relationships. So we have this dedicated team in each community uh, that works with landlords. Um, so we, last I checked, that's probably much more than this now. We, we work with 150 landlords. Uh, around the state, and uh, it's very important for us to keep those relationships uh, healthy and intact because that's how we uh, make this program work. Um, so we're always looking for more housing, but really what we've done is create solid relationships with community landlords. Many of them have multiple properties, um, and I've learned uh, that they can trust us. I think you know, uh, in a lot of other programs, landlords feel burned, and we work very hard to make sure that they're in, um, they have someone to communicate with um, at all times regarding who we're placing in the in the car. But some of the landlords might get a lot of pushback from the community. They do, yes. Not house they do. So there's a lot of those people. Yep, mm -hmm. exactly. And we work to um, make them feel comfortable, and we work to find people who are interested in, in making a difference in the community and, and helping them. That's, that's true. And this is a really strong part partnership. What, with what the is the obligation of the offender? When they agree to go into your housing, what is the obligation that they make? Their obligation to is to uh, agree to sign a standard lease agreement and do their best to adhere by the standard conditions of a lease like any person would in the community. Yep. Uh, to have an ongoing service relationship with our services team to work towards their goals. And they agree, uh, they sign a uh, agreement to have open collaboration and communication with the Department of Corrections mm -hmm. District Office and Pathways and themselves throughout their tenure in their program so that we can support them to adhere to the conditions of their release. Um, so I'm in jail and I agree to anything to get out of jail. <laughs> yeah. um, <clears throat> what happens when I fail in that agreement, for example? Uh, I don't know what the requirements yeah. are, but what I mean, are they automatically technically violated and sent back to jail and lose their housing? No. no. So what if they take three steps backwards? Yeah, so I think the benefit to this really individualized approach and why we see higher success rates than uh, you know, congregate living or uh, programs that have a lot of their own program rules is that there are very few things that our program would ever do that would say, okay, you're out and you're out for good, right? Of course, if someone um, is violating the conditions of their release, it's the Department of Corrections and Probation and Parole Office's responsibility to see if that is contending with community safety, right? But as um, our DOC partners were talking about, really the uh, culture has changed a lot now, right, in terms of that and the PP offices are really invested in supporting people to stay in community. So if things aren't working, it tends to be a conversation that can be managed in the community, uh, unless you know someone is really at risk of, of committing a new crime or um, at high risk of, of violating community safety. And uh, we see people, um, you know, we do we do see people who go uh, into jail on technical violation uh, and. Part of the benefit of this program is that we're able to keep that residence secure if somebody's in short term. So if someone goes in for five days or 10 days, right, we, we lock up their apartment, we make sure it's secure, we notify the land that they're out, but they're coming back. And then right after that five or 10 days, they're, they're right back in their apartment, right? There's no delay in that. We've also seen people that we've served multiple times in this program. Uh, we know that for each individual, we can't predict what is going to be this exactly the successful structure, right? Uh, but it would be very, very rare that our program would say we won't give it another shot with somebody. Um, that's part of the model. This is uh, really a sort of engagement approach and a desire to try and try again. And uh, that's you know what's been demonstrated as highly successful in working with the chronically homeless population, which is the uh, where the Housing First model started with and is now being demonstrated as highly successful with working with people out of institutions. <coughs> Could, can you estimate how many people you'd be able to serve? There are 230 
How many people are out of state today? Do you know? 276. 276. How much of that is due to the construction at Newport? Very little Very related little. to Newport. Okay. Um, Say there's 275 people out of state. How many of those could you serve? Not the out of staters, but how many people? What's your capacity of additional population that you think you could serve if, you, if money, you know, if the money was available? Yeah, if, if money were available and, that, and no object, we believe we have, um, we've created something that we can scale <coughs> as big as it would need to be. And our, uh, what we would love to be able to do is to be able to offer this service to anybody in the state who's in need of it. How many? How much does it cost per individual? Do you have a break? I can get you. I don't have my per individual number right here. Forty-three dollars. Um, yeah, I was going to say it's about forty-five-ish dollars a day. Forty-five a day. Yeah, and that's, that's three hundred sixty-five days. That's forty-five dollars. Right. Something in the range of sixteen-ish thousand dollars okay, so uh, a year for both rental assistance and supportive services. Okay, so. And that's on average, right? Per per and, individual. And out of state, we're paying around twenty-seven thousand. <clears throat> It's roughly thirty thousand total for us. Say thirty thousand, you can do it for say seventeen thousand rough figures. So yeah, each person you took out, stay would say thirteen thousand to reinvest. Give or take. Give or take. That's the. What do you mean? Well, I don't know if that would work out in corrections math quite like that. Because we've dealt with that in terms of bed savings and trying to equate it with out of state beds, but there's it's not a linear line. Am I off base, Matt? Not at all. No, I think that because of because of the, the churn of folks coming in that unless we truly are reducing out of state beds, there there really, we don't see the savings that, that is well, anticipated. Well no, but if you have they serve the 100 people that are currently out of state. I mean, if they serve the 100 more people, you were able to reduce out of state population by 100. I can't believe there wouldn't be significant savings. That's actually, that, that's great. Yeah, you know, the, I, I'm not talking about each one bed, I'm talking about a, a number of beds. So <clears throat> the problem is, let's say 270. You know, I think the the goal of the ASH plan, ASHE um, plan, Senator Ash, not ASH. Um, the plan was eliminate out of state beds by 20 whatever. Okay? So, it, pathways, or some other program, developed the model to remove 100, to reduce our population currently incarcerated by 100. And you were able to re to reduce the out of state population to 170. There'd be the savings of calling it 30,000 times 100. Stop me, I'm not sure. I'm really mm -hmm. But huh? differential in cost. Oh, yeah. So I figured in rough, if it's 16,000 per year for an offender to house them. How much we pay out of state? 27,000. It's 27,000 for the person. So I said. 40, Okay, I did 20, I figured 10,000 times. Whatever, it's just well, significant you're at saving million. if they can actually deal 12, with people who are currently incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And obviously there would, you don't know what the crime rate might be and how many people, new people might come in, but it's just a, a conversation that I think is worth having if you have, if you have that population. But it sounds well, like the difference seven. between Pathways and some of the other programs is the so openness to take anybody yes, versus the, the, uh, the, the, I don't know, I won't use the term, but the ability to take anyone who is eligible for release and the Department of Corrections feels can be released. So uh, I'm just going by those numbers. 
great. It's quarter to one. We're scheduled to stop at quarter to one. Why don't we get back at 1.30? So, huh? Should I start in or should yeah, I start Yeah, please do. Oh, okay. Okay, so uh, for the record, my name is Rebecca Schmerer, uh, head of the Appellate Division of the Office of Defender General, here in my capacity as Vice Chair for the Sentencing Commission. Judge Zoni could not make it uh, today. But I'm here because the committee requested uh, I mean, some pull out discussion on a portion of the sentencing report that we submitted last month, November 27th. You have the entire copy, but for the purposes of today, the question was concerning the change to the juvenile jurisdiction statute. That's the last three, uh, two pages out of the copy. And I don't think I'll be able to get in time the electronic version, but we all have the hard copies. Yep. So I'm here because the Sentencing Commission received a request from the legislature uh, I think the timing possibly was last session uh, for this commission to come up with a proposed solution to uh, what I'll call jurisdictional gaps that were inadvertently uh, created when the jurisdictional juvenile jurisdictional statutes were passed in 2015. And this gap we're talking about concerns certain offenses that are committed by individuals under 18, but where the, the prosecutor or the charges on the final time after the child 18. So there were these categories of, of offenses and cases where there it wasn't clear, that wasn't clear who had jurisdiction, the criminal courts or the, or the family courts. Now, um, the proposal here addresses the uh, less serious crimes, that being the not listed crimes or the Big 12, because the legislature fixed those gaps moving to the Big 12 a long time ago, 2011, predating the juvenile jurisdiction statute at um, Act 153. Uh, in terms of the legislature's work last year to fix that gap, the focus was on listed offenses. And so that gap uh, was fixed, and you'll see that fix here um, going to the statute A1, capital B. Right? And so that was addressed. Little A, 1A, big A, addresses the big 12 offenses. Uh, capital B addresses the little the list of offenses. C that follows. But the underlying language contains the proposed uh, fix to address offenses that are, don't fall under the 12 or are not listed. So the less so, serious offenses. So help me, a uh, uh, um, kid steals a car. Would that be in C? It could be, but if it's not a robbery or assault, right? It's on the state. Right, a, just, a just joyride. Offense, right, then it could be under the it's, uh, what, six months misdemeanor? So nonviolent felonies usually go uh, 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 misdemeanors. Uh, yeah, it's a, it would be a nonviolent misdemeanor. Yeah. So, Joyriding. So that would be. So that would be. So that would be under this provision. Now that would be a juvenile court. It would be under a juvenile court. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So that's um, what this does. Yes, and this is again to uh, address the situation where the prosecutor doesn't file charges until after eighteen. So the proposed language was reached by consensus. It was a subcommittee of the Sentencing Commission came together and uh, worked out, hashed out the language that you see here. That subcommittee was made up of members uh, of DCF, uh, state attorneys, defendant generals, uh, and Judge Grayson as well, and uh, DOC. Um, so it was the critical stakeholders uh, reaching this consensus on this language. They brought the language to the full body and the commission voted it out. Uh, and I just want to point out, and so that, so that language, and then going to the second page, you see, again, the proposed language there underlined under subsection C3. Uh, that, again, spells out in detail, establishing that these are the like to the 
um, and that it extends the family court supervisory jurisdiction over these cases until the defendant's 20th birthday. And so again, that is uh, the proposed language that was uh, worked out by the consensus on one of these groups. I just wanted to point out because uh, <coughs> Uh, these are question of the chats actually point this out to me. Uh, the language here in C, you yep. see the age 17 uh, years old, but before it's been 18 years old, just for the record, those aren't to be locked in stone. That reflects current law, but of course, what was passed was the graduated effects in the July 1, 2020. Right. Those ages change. And so just view those as sort of placeholders, but for sure. approved for when this goes to drafting phase, uh, yeah. something that follows what passed, which is like current, and then all of the graduate I think phase. there's a bill on this, if I'm not mistaken. Is there not, Brent? Um, we have a bill on the youth book that changes to, to the status. We do. Um, Senate has a bill, but it doesn't have this language in it. Okay. But we could ask. Mm -hmm. And, and that is, that is, it, is, is, we already have the bill, or is we it? We have a bill that is uh, working within the, these statutes, these full offender and juvenile delinquency chapters. Mm -hmm. And so it, would, um, it could fit in there once you take up the bill. Yeah, it's already in committee. Right, it's been, yes, it's been, I, it is a bill. I think I introduced a bill this year to, mm -hmm. to do this. We'll, t we'll all look into it. Maybe Eric has it. We'll all take a check on that. But you're all so good that you do these things, and I can't remember what I did. That's why we have staff. That's why we have a list. Ah. That's why we have staff. But that is the um, extent of what I wanted to share today with the committee. Happy to feel any questions. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's Thank you. Go ahead, please. Okay. So yesterday, the working group, um, the Justice Green Investigation <coughs> Working Group, came to for the fourth meeting since late August. Um, at prior meetings, we had worked to identify you know, the design of the state supervision system to talk about diversion programs and opportunities that Vermont has um, built through the Department of Corrections and through um, other means and statutory changes that have gone on for the last 20 years or so. Um, we also, in November, presented on reported crime trends and sentencing trends, but yesterday was sort of the, the big, long meeting to look at corrections data that had taken us up to yesterday, essentially, to really analyze and understand. Um, and one of the key goals of Justice Reinvestment, too, here in Vermont is, um, was always to understand the role that revocations from community supervision play um, for the prison population. So that was the, the focus of a lot of what we talked about yesterday. This is a summary slide um, that I'll walk through some pieces that inform this, but the key, um, our key takeaways when we look at that corrections data are that the state's incarcerated population has grown in recent years, even though historically Vermont has seen a decline in its corrections populations from people being incarcerated for detention, or sentenced, um, probation, parole, and furlough. In more recent years, the last few years, there are actually increases in the number of people who are incarcerated for a prison sentence or who are being detained. Um, even as that's happening, the Department of Corrections has been receiving level funding, like other state agencies, in that same period of time, which we would argue actually constitutes sort of a cut in, in many programs and services um, the department, I think, understandably, can't stop paying for more people coming in um, to maintain and provide health care to those folks to see nothing of other fixed costs. And so the reality is other things um, end up being decreased. Over the last three years, the average, this is, I want to rewrite this bullet point. Essentially, 78% of prison, sentenced prison admissions in the state are um, driven by people who are coming off of probation, parole, or furlough. 
Those are revocations from probation and for, and sorry, probation and parole. They are returns to prison for people on furlough, and that's because some of those folks are being revoked. Some of those phones or folks are um, experiencing something called a furlough interrupt, which is a graduated sanction. It's a very short period of time that they're coming in for up to five days. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, so that could be the same person coming in five times. Um, we don't think it is. And we actually looked at the data to see how often people are returning, and it looks like on average in a four-year period, people who do return to incarceration off of furlough, it's happening about twice. There are some folks where it's, I think it was 8% of people who returned in that period um, returned off of furlough five times or more, but that was a, a smaller percentage. The average is, is two times. Um, we have heard from people who are incarcerated or on supervision that it, 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 they cycle over a longer period of time, many times um, off of furlough. Um, technical violations make up the largest percentages of supervision returns and revocations, um, particularly for the furlough population. And I'll show kind of what that breakdown looks like between probation, parole, and furlough. The length of stay for people who are returned or revoked to prison is generally short. That also varies depending on where people are coming from, which supervision status, but um, it's, it's always for a few months, generally speaking. Research indicates uh, that most people, and this is not just research on Vermont, just general um, research and social studies have shown that people um, are most likely to reoffend in the first years after they're released from prison. So there's a sort of a window of time and focus when people um, are in more need potentially of services, programs, and supervision that will support them being successful in the community. And as there's a graph that we showed yesterday that you can see as they continue to succeed or remain on community supervision, um, the longer that goes, the less likely they are to reoffend. And so we would just argue that that's the importance of front-loading services and programs for folks. Um, which I think the, the uh, testimony I heard about the pathways housing first model is very focused on that as well. Um, and then level funding for GOC and combined with limited community-based resources across the state have resulted in large numbers of higher risk people not being able to receive the programming and services they need um, that would probably help address their criminogenic risks and behavioral health needs in the community. So a few slides that I pulled out of 75, um, again, which you have all of, but just for the purposes of today. Um, this is the slide I would use to show that growth in the incarcerated population over time um, between 2016 and 2019. And the other important thing about this slide is that we show how um, where you see Vermont's current DOC facilities being over capacity. Um, the prisons were built to hold about 1,100 people. If you counted the in-state uh, sentenced pop or in-state incarcerated population, which means people who are detained and people who are sentenced, there are almost 1,500 people. Um, that's 136 percent capacity. Counting the people who are serving some of their sentences in Mississippi, you've got 161 percent capacity. So it's an overcrowded correction system. Um, and again, some of those populations are growing in recent years. This is um, a very simple representation of that level funding that DOC has experienced. Um, and the realities of that are inevitably that as incarcerated populations are going up, um, costs associated with those populations will increase as well. But level funding um, won't meet those, those um, costs necessarily, and so the department any department in this under this situation would have to look for cuts in other places. Um, we certainly heard from a lot of people who were related to programming and services inside and outside of um, correction settings, describing how they used to offer more, but they, they had to offer less now because contracts have gotten necessarily smaller. So can I ask a question? On just the num numbers, previous chart, uh, actually housed in state which is 1493. Does that include the federal, the marshals, or not? That's a great question. I don't know. I, let me get back to you on that. Just one of the from corrections, it's on Dale. Yeah, I just don't know. Would that include our federal marshals? Yes, everyone. 
It's detained and in the sentence. Actually housed in state. 1493. Would that include our federal, our federal marshals? If we're counting everyone, it would include that. So we don't have any control over who comes and goes for the federal marshals. They contract for the beds. But, we, but they're the ones who control who comes in and who goes out. Correct. And how many beds do we have for the marshals? I don't know 60? how many That's what we've heard. 60? We could not contract with them. I can find out if you give me a I'm just curious to see about the 14 Why don't we give them a few minutes to find out and continue on? Yeah, and I can go back to Ed, my colleague. But as you look at the, if you look at the funding issue, <coughs> then you'd have more of a problem with yeah. funding right. corrections if you didn't have with a margin. The but they take up some of the beds. Well, they right. do, but they pay mm -hmm. higher than what we're paying out of state. Mm -hmm. Little known fact. Yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, th this next slide was sort of the, the kickoff to the conversation that we had yesterday around the role that revocations and returns to prisons uh, play in the prison admissions population. So just people coming into DOC facilities on sentenced incarcerations. Um, not people who are detained pre-trial. New court commitments make up 20% of prison admissions, sentence prison admissions. Parole violators make up only 5%. Probation violators make up 20%. But furlough violators make up 53%. And I'll just say again, this is a combination. The data doesn't allow us to exactly pull out how many of those furlough violators are people coming in on graduated sanctions for very short stays, up to five days, and how many are staying um, because for longer, up to usually around 90 days, or, or most people are only staying as long as 90 days for revocations. Um, but so that is a combined population for the furlough folks. It's still, having said that, a very high percentage of prison admissions that um, is driven by folks coming off of supervision. Um, Something else I want to note that Ed, my colleague who um, did all this analysis and joined us yesterday by phone, said at the end of the meeting, which I should have noted earlier, is that, as you all know, Vermont's a unified system, so there are no jails for people to go. That's why you have, a, obviously, a detainee population in, in state prisons. It's also why you'll see um, folks with graduated sanctions for up to five days going into your prison system, because in other places where that policy exists, people are usually serving those short stints of one, two, three days in their local jail, or in a jail where there's a contracted bed space available. Um, in Vermont, it's all going into your prison system. So it's just worth reminding that there aren't perfect comparisons because of that unified system that you all have. Um, half of Vermont's sentenced prison population at the end of, or almost half, 46% at the end of this year, were made up of people who had returned from community supervision. Um, and again, that's primarily coming from furlough violators. So new court commitments are on 41% of the population, and then all the supervision statuses combined is 46%. So did you look at some of those um, furlough violations in new court? You had 13, 18 total people. So those are unique individuals. This isn't someone, doesn't capture someone who may have committed a new crime and also a furlough violator. It's one person, yes, it's one not person. multiple. My understanding is that because this is the snapshot. So admissions can be s someone coming in multiple times. It could be the same person for different reasons. Um, I believe. Yes. The prison population is, this is sort of static because it's a snapshot. So it's almost like if you looked today, this, these numbers would look a little different today than they did yesterday, but mm -hmm. you know, in a moment in time, who was incarcerated. Um, and that's, that's the unique individual. So, so they may be the same person? There may be for the this, same for the sentence pop, For this snapshot population, no, no I don't believe it. I, I, oh, sorry, I think they, these are all one person. It's not multiple cases counted. Um, this is more of, if you look at your beds, kind of who's in those beds. Um, the other piece that we presented on yesterday was looking at how this all plays out for women in Vermont, women who are incarcerated. 
um, for sentence to prison terms. And bearing in mind this is a very small population, only 106 women um, in this snapshot, there are two things happening on this slide. The first is that the pie chart shows the underlying offense for which women were sentenced to prison. So the vast majority are there for violent or property crimes um, or convictions for those crimes. But when you look at the immediate reason why people are incarcerated, that's where we see that revocation and return to prison being another key driver. So 58% of women um, who are incarcerated today are there off of a violation from supervision of some kind. Um, but their underlying sentences are for fairly serious offenses, um, almost half for violent crimes. So I had a question last night. I was going through this. And the property crimes, burglary, forgery, fraud, one stolen property. Are those crimes that involve a person, a victim? I don't know. Because that's what I'll ask Ed how, how that's that what we were looking at, Butch, in mm -hmm. terms of property crime. Um, because then those are felonies. Mm -hmm. If they involve the person. Well, it also Burglary into an unoccupied dwelling. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, but is that a list of eleven? Burglary in an unoccupied dwelling. It's a list of it's a felony. Well, they, mm -hmm. they, it says all underlying offenses, so it could be, you know, right. burglary was the highest, but there may have been a series of crimes. Yes, like that, that actually is important. So something that he did was he looked at the most serious. So everything here, it's right. It's not necessarily the entirety of a person's, um, if their case had multiple convictions or charges associated with it. Um, Ed kind of rounded up, if you will, to the most serious. Most in, in all of these, um, any slide that shows that kind of underlying offense data is meant to reflect the more serious of the conviction. Because we often hear, particularly for the women's uh, folks who are incarcerated, are there for bad checks. Mm -hmm. That's what we hear a lot. We hear that a lot. That's that, is it an anecdote or is it real? That they're there for bad checks. I mean, not I without knowing. This is again, this is such a small population. So 100 people, 10 people can have a, a pretty big impact on how any of these percentages change. Um, so this is just the snapshot that that we saw when Ed looked at it. But um, but I do know that having looked at this you know, only for a few months, but versions of this, it, it, the impact of violent offenses on the reason why women are incarcerated in Vermont, we saw this also in the sentencing data as well. Um, it's, it's sort of skewing towards the more violent offenses than, than others. But a reminder again that the additional piece here is still more than half of women who are incarcerated today have come off of supervision, and that's why they are incarcerated. So. They may have originally been convicted for these things. They, they were, but also um, a lot of them are coming back. They could have had a bad check on property crime and then have been violated yes. on probation, had their probation violated. Then they get a furlough, then they get right. sent back on their furlough, blah, 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 keeps going. Yeah, even so it's, it's, yeah. it's not It's not easy to... Ellen, I think I heard you say that the women that are coming back in are no longer being supervised by the DOC. Is that oh, no, they're being supervised. They're still, under, they still, oh, are, still are under supervision. Well, their community supervision, I mean, they're not under community supervision when they're being incarcerated, right. then they're in facilities, and then um, they're leaving on to community supervision again when they, when they go back. Okay. So they are still currently under some sort of supervision when they defend or they're Yes, yes. Um, and let's say max out their sentence. Unless, yeah, they're they, coming they, out with a sentence to serve or split probation, they still get under supervision. Do you know how many people that is people who are maxed out? Um, well, uh, no, that's a good question. I'll ask Ed if we can look into that. I know that when we're talking about revocations or returns, we're talking about people who were, who had not maxed out, who were on supervision. They were, you know, on probation or furlough, and then they came back into prison right from that that status, from that supervision. Um, so it's, it is possible that people, you know, they complete their supervision, they've maxed it out, and then they're in the community, and 
I would, you know, then they're not going to be violated to come back in. They will be arrested yeah, and reconvicted of a new crime, and that might be why they come back in. It was uh, quite a conversation yesterday about people who burned their bridges, and they, you know, they run out of family members who will take them, run out of friends that will take them, and then they're, they're, they're back in jail. And, and they may be bad checks, but they, it was also unreported crime. Oh, yeah, sure. Stealing from family members to buy drugs, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, and I, I think the folks who come into this would fall into that new court commission, new court commitment, right, mm -hmm. rather, so the 41% of people. So if someone, if I, if I left prison and I was on furlough and I, I did well eventually on furlough and I ended up on parole and then I served out my whole parole term and I was discharged from parole and then I um, um, I commit a robbery and I'm rearrested and I'm reconvicted then I would in this pie chart fall into the yellow new court commitment um, because even though I had previously been on supervision I was not actively on supervision when I came back into prison. But it's a, it's a point well taken. There are longer criminal histories than just this one one thing may encompass. Um, we drilled a little bit into the <clears throat> where we could the reasons why people are the types of violations that are leading to people returning um, from furlough or being revoked from probation and parole. And in the case of furlough returns, uh, the vast majority of these reasons are for technical violations rather than new offense or new crime violations. Um, and uh, these are the types of technical violations that were flagged in the data that indicate some of the reasons why folks are, um, the, the types of violations that people are um, committing or and, and being um, returned for. Again, potentially for very short periods of time and then in other cases for longer periods of time. Um, something I want to point out that's in sort of the black text here on the bottom left is that, uh, and we talked about this a lot yesterday, from our perspective, a key structural challenge in, in what is going on with furlough is that it is um, statutorily defined essentially as an extension of a person's incarceration sentence. So it was established as in part and expanded on as a legal status, and there are multiple versions of it now, um, partly to provide an opportunity for people to be released early, pre-minimum, into the community. Um, and that just creates um, a response mechanism inherently built into that definition that a person is essentially incarcerated but outside. And so we would argue that in part one of the reasons why there's a higher rate of technical violations leading to people going back into prison even for short periods of time um, which is quite different when, than when you compare to two other populations of people who are supervised by the same Department of Corrections with the, many of the same policies and, and, and certainly the same staff. These differences might partly be explained by just the definition of furlough as treating or, or responding to a person as though they are serving out a period of their incarceration outside of prison. Um, something else that, that is true, however, is that Currently, very few people on furlough were released before they reached their minimum in prison. Most people are leaving prison at or after their minimum sentence. Um, so furlough sort of thought of and designed to be an early release mechanism, but functionally it's not operating that way. So in many cases, you know, we are a national organization, we work with a lot of states. I will look at that for the furlough system and I say, in another state, that's a person who would be on parole. That's what you would have a parole system that would, that would sort of take over that person, which can look very different in different places. Um, and we've talked a lot as a working group about the peculiarities and the complexities of Vermont's supervision system, which is quite complex. Um, this is also where we show, again, uh, the reasons for revocations on parole and probation are much more evenly split between a person having committed a new crime or having committed um, technical violations such that they are revoked. But that, that furlough um, return category just sort of dips into a much higher rate of the technical violations that are leading to a person going back into prison. Um, we also talked a lot yesterday about the impact that this kind of repeated return has on individuals and on a system. And so this is just one representation of just the numbers that we're talking about. Um, almost 3,000 people 
had a furlough return over the last four years, that constituted over or maybe exactly 5,800 furlough return events, which means people, to what we were saying earlier, people are having multiple furlough returns in four-year periods. On average, that's about two per person. If, if they return, it happens about twice in four years. Um, and the, the median length of time that a person is on furlough before they are returned, if, if they become part of that furlough return cohort, is four months. So again, that speaks to the vulnerability and the riskiness, if you will, of that initial period of time when a person comes out of prison. And again, this is just bears out in research anywhere that people are at higher risk of reoffending um, and recidivating in the first months and, and years, but particularly that first year post-release. And so in Vermont, the status under which those people are being supervised is furlough, which again is the status that is uniquely defined as an extension of someone's incarceration. And so you've got really high-risk folks with kind of a different response mechanism built into the status that they're being supervised under. Um, and we, we talked yesterday about the, um, this puts a lot of strain on your correction system, undoubtedly, in many ways. It's also a huge um, amount of disruption to a person's life and to the individual who is um, <clears throat> facing enormous challenges and, and um, struggling in their own way to try to re-enter their community successfully. Um, we also then looked uh, at sort of what it looks like to move from furlough to parole or what that interaction is. Um, and 90% of people who were granted parole uh, had already been in the community on furlough. So there's a pretty clear path that people are following when they get to parole and, and it's that they're on furlough first. Um, and on average, looking at a sample of about 500 people, folks who were approved for parole had been on furlough for seven to eight months. So um, it's somewhat reductive on my part, but I keep thinking about if people fail, they tend to fail within four months. If they succeed and they get to parole, it's within seven to eight months. And so that's kind of a window of, um, of opportunity uh, and certainly of, of high risk for folks as well. Um, and the other thing I'll point out is that you've got a parole board who has a pretty steady rate, at least over the last three years, of um, their grants and denials for role for those who have applied for that. Um, and then another really big topic of conversation that came up yesterday, and you'll see a lot of slides on this, I think, um, but this is the one that I would zero in on, this and the following, which are going back to that level funding and just sort of the strain that puts on a corrections department with growing populations and other fixed costs that they have to meet. Um, is that inevitably there are people who are not necessarily going to receive the programs that EOC has worked very hard to make available and to um, develop around evidence-based practices and curricula. So the Department of Corrections offers people who are assessed as medium to high risk and who are convicted of a listed offense. Those folks have access inside EOC facilities and in the community to something called risk reduction programming, which is um, robust programming that is made available to people who meet the criteria about nine to 18 months before they leave prison, and then it is available across the state. It's, it's a, a well-accessed, widely available program for anyone who, again, medium to high risk listed offense. Um, medium to high risk makes all the sense in the world, that you want to be focusing on the people of higher risk when you're giving them this type of inter intensive um, intervention or supervision programming. What's hard is that DOC is, is limited in being able to provide all medium to high risk people with this programming because, again, of funding limitations. And so they've got that second necessary um, piece that people have to have, which is being convicted of a listed offense. So what we wanted to look at was who's left behind when you have that, that criteria, um, who might otherwise be benefiting from that risk reduction programming. And um, we're looking at medium to high risk people who are not convicted of illicit offense. That's almost a quarter of the total people who are medium to high risk who are incarcerated. So about 25% of people who you might otherwise want to get that programming is they are not getting that programming while they're incarcerated. When you look at the community side where the populations are bigger, um, the medium to high risk people who are supervised in the community who are not receiving programming, again, because they're not convicted of illicit offense, that's almost half of the total medium to high risk population. Um, so there are a lot of people who, again, would probably benefit from that, who I know DOC would, would like to be able to extend that programming to, and that's, that's a big gap. 
We also talked a little bit about how there are a lot of people who are lower risk, um, and in the community that's almost 5,000 people, who probably shouldn't receive risk reduction programming that is well designed and focused on meeting the high risk people, but there are people with lower risks but other needs that may not be met who are more reliant on what's available locally. Um, and so we've talked a lot over this process about what exists in one county or one community that doesn't exist in other places and it doesn't mean there's no need, it's just a resource problem. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that there are lower risk people um, who will have different needs that don't rise to the level of meeting DOC's really intensive programming, but they are probably having um, any number of things go unmet locally as well. Um, and then this was the sort of last data slide I wanted to share with you all, which is a national comparison of where this percentage of um, prison admissions made up of people coming off of supervision and the prison population made up of people <clears throat> coming off of supervision, where that places Vermont. So if you were to just look at probation and parole populations combined, Vermont would have the sixth lowest um, admissions um, rate, if you will, made up of people who are revoked in the country. If you add furlough violators to that, however, Vermont would have the highest. Um, that 78% that is higher um, than any other, other state. Again, caveats because furlough is unique in Vermont and, and unified systems, and you've got a mixture of populations, but it, it's still um, well above most other places. And then on the percentage of the prison population that's comprised of people who are revoked from probation and parole, Vermont would be 16th lowest. If it was just those two populations adding in furlough, Vermont would be sixth highest. Um, so again, it's, it's, um, there's a lot of returning that's happening in the state, um, which is driving uh, and a lot of what's going on with prison populations and admissions and putting a lot of pressure on the correction system. Um, we then have also present, well, let me stop and just see, are there any, I was gonna shift into a new section, but I just wanna see if there are any questions on any of that. Um, there are many more slides that I just pulled out the summary for here that uh, addressed assessment work that we conducted through site visits and sitting in on programming that was offered inside prisons and in the community and then also meeting with um, staff across the state, supervision staff across the state in a few different places. Um, and so there are, oh, there's a lot of information in the full presentation around sort of where we see Vermont doing really excellent work and where there's opportunity for improvements or for need for improvements. Something that we said yesterday, I hope it was well delivered or, or that people really heard us, is that Vermont is, um, Vermont's in a, in a rare position. The state and the Department of Corrections, um, through legislative actions, through agency leadership actions, through the training of staff, down to the, the interactions that we've observed with staff, is doing a really good job of making sure that people um, who are lower risk with lower criminal or, or shorter criminal histories are essentially having much less interaction with the criminal justice system. The state has done a really wonderful job of working with people to lower recidivism, particularly among people who have lower risk. Many states are working to get to where Vermont is, um, both in implementing and adopting evidence-based policies and in significantly shifting the populations of people who are in corrections today. The challenge is that because of that good work, the people who remain in the correction system under DOC control, one kind or another, are higher risk and higher need. And so it's sort of a, a critical moment for the state to evolve and step up a little bit in what the interventions and the programs look like for those higher risk, higher needs people um, if the state really wants to continue moving forward in safely reducing populations and helping people be successful in the community. Um, so a big piece of what we presented on yesterday was identifying the strengths that we see in Vermont and also again kind of identifying where there are, um, there are necessary improvements to get to that next level of working with a, a harder population of folks. And so this is a summary of a lot of that um, that I can walk through, but again there are many slides that sort of support this in greater detail. I would say that the key takeaway for us is that larger text at the bottom which is the positives of what Vermont has built, and then the realities of what limited resources have um, resulted in, and the need for some stronger implementation of even the policies that exist today. 
And then we also spent time yesterday looking at how people with behavioral health needs are, um, are worked with or how those needs are met and addressed in the criminal justice system. And this is, again, a summary of several slides that was based uh, on our observations and conversations with people across the state. Um, I think the, the key of a lot of this is that, similar to what I've described in corrections, which was you know something that me had heard someone say at some point was it's sort of a triage mentality. Again, we don't have enough to give everyone we want to, so we have to focus on who we most immediately have to give that to. Um, I think something similar is happening a little bit on the behavioral health side where you have more resources available for people who rise to the level of having serious mental illness or who have opioid addiction, um, because Vermont's doing a lot on, on, for those populations of folks. But there's sort of a whole world of people in between, many of whom have co-occurring disorders or mental health needs that are not at the level of serious mental illness. Um, and what's available to them is, is also very disparate and variable across the state. And there's probably areas where coordination of care really needs to be improved in order for supervision officers to even know more about what their clients need and how they can help connect them to services in the community. And this is my last slide. I'm just trying to scroll. This was sort of the summary of the whole thing. It's really a good outline, a good summary. appreciate that. Okay. Um, going back to slide 15 at the bottom, the, the uh, Vermont's connect correction system is increasingly populated by people of higher risk and needs. Um, and that can be addressed through effective supervision practice and access. But limited resources have held the state back. I think that may be the, one of the critical takeaways for me <coughs> is having our colleagues in the House and Senate, and the administration and others, recognize that we are now dealing with a much more difficult group of people in our correction system than we might have been talking about 10 or 15 years ago. But that the resources that we haven't put into that population, they require much more intensive resources to hold them accountable, but at the same time to have them you know, get rehabilitated. I think that might be the most important takeaway of all this that we, <coughs> the, the full, and that's part of the difficulty in getting good people working in corrections. I, when we met at St. Albans, one of the things that I came away from that meeting with the officers was how many people they start out with who don't even last a month. Because it's a really difficult group to work with. Um, and how you know, I'm sure the same thing in Rutland's. Um, so I, I appreciate this. It's very helpful. Something I want to say, Senator, I, I would agree. I think that is that's the story I see in Vermont. That again, you have a harder population, and that's the product of really good work. A lot of states are trying to get there. But the other side is it's not impossible to work with those folks. It just to your what you're saying, it takes a little bit more. And I do want to note something that um, my colleague David um, emphasized yesterday, which is that from our observations of supervision officers and their interactions with their clients in the community, they were really strong. And, and that's not just luck, that's training as well. The Department of Corrections has invested in training that we see for and out in the quality of the supervision um, in the officers who we witness. And so in that in sort of limited view, but, but it gives us optimism that it's an example where Vermont has a, a strong infrastructure to build on to work with higher, higher risk, higher needs populations. Um, but it is kind of a critical next step uh, that the state needs to take. Can I just get a, a definition of higher risk? Um, what types of crimes have these people? It's not the crimes. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's need. So, yes. It's needs. So, so crime. So when I say risk, the the and I'm not going to do as, as good a job as my colleague, who's a, an expert on risk assessments. But there are validated risk assessment tools um, and screeners that the Department of Corrections uses 
to assess a person for their criminogenic risk. So offense and crime is actually not part of it. It's a number of other factors. Um, it can be criminal thinking. It can be their, the age of their first interaction with the criminal justice system. Um, criminal history, to an extent, comes into that in, in that same way. Um, their associations, there are a number of factors that are assessed that um, statistically indicate a person's greater likelihood of reoffending. And so criminogenic risk, in, in some cases, sort of counterintuitively, you may have someone who has been convicted of a very serious offense, but actually is low risk, meaning they'll probably never do that again. You know, and, and that's for a variety of reasons. So um, and oftentimes, people who are very high criminogenic risk are, have not necessarily been convicted of, of serious offenses, but other factors in their life um, lead to a higher likelihood that they will continue to move through the criminal justice system through reoffending and violation behavior. So um, there, it, it's a little bit of a different concept than just someone who will go do the exact same thing necessarily, but it's based on, on a number of factors, and I'm sure Dale actually can speak to, to that in much greater detail. It's tough right? to move from a crime-oriented mm -hmm. discussion to a risk-oriented discussion, mm -hmm. and that, that difficult. We fall into that trap as legislators. There's a certain crime that we find so abhorrent that we want to make sure that there's a long sentence attached to it. Could be murder, could be aggravated sexual assault. But you know, take some of the cases that have been fairly high profile in other states. Where somebody murdered someone who had tormented them, who had sold them into slavery as a sex slave. I think there's a woman in Tennessee that received a pardon from the governor mm -hmm. who had, you know, killed her, um, the person who was trafficking her. So, you know, she's probably fairly low risk to ever commit another crime like that because of all the circumstances. Yeah. But somebody else who, you know, may be high risk whose main crime has been okay. forging. But continuing to, to to the desire to get the drugs. I think um, when I met with Jim Baker last earlier this week, um, we got talking, or it was last Friday, he was talking about in Rutland when he was chief, they figured 75,000 was the cost per year to keep a heroin habit going. And you think of all the people in Rutland five years ago that made 75 grand. And that was before they put food on the table, housing, whatever else, is, you need 75,000 just for your heroin. So the amount of money that went into that, but if you solve that heroin problem, you wouldn't need it anymore. I also agree to what you're saying, Senator, about moving from an offense or crime-based yep. to a risk-based system. Something else that um, is not adequately represented in these slides, but it's in the larger presentation, is where we see um, the state overall and, and the Department of Corrections in particular are doing that. And there are also a lot of slides where we try to represent the many different places where the Department of Corrections is uh, conducting risk assessments, um, identifying people based on their criminogenic risk, and then um, how you see that play out um, in their failure or success rates on probation and furlough. And so the good news is, again, you've got a corrections department that going back quite a few years at this point has and moved in the direction of, well, let's use these tools to identify people and then um, specifically connect them to the types of supervision and the types of programs that make the most sense for them. And that's, again, there are states that are still trying to do that. So Vermont has moved, moved to that place and now understanding that you know that you have a higher risk um, population of people. It's the, the next level of what can we make available to them and how can we work with them a little bit differently. Any other questions? I'm, Mary? Thank you. I'm sorry that I missed the beginning and forgive me if I'm asking. Do you have set a, a, a set of recommendations for next steps we should be taking? Not yet. That's the next. So we're, the working group is coming back together January 22nd and that will be when we come with specific policy recommendations and as much as possible um, estimates for impacts of what those policies might, might mean. Essentially, where that might lower populations, allow for some savings, et cetera. And there's good news, Mary. Yes. With, mm -hmm. and I see Diane sitting there. She's here for the money. Oh, because when we, when we, if we implement, if yeah. we pass legislation 
based upon these recommendations from the government, <coughs> federal money will be available to us to help implement those policies for the next two years. Yep. This, so the funding for this phase of the work comes from the Bureau of Justice Assistance, um, and for those, um, for those, oh yeah, we're losing power. Yeah, we're losing power. Um, for those states that do pass and reinvest some money as part of this process, um, they're eligible to apply for additional funding where colleagues of mine would come and work with the state for a year or two to help implement them and to monitor what the impacts of the policies are and make adjustments to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do. So funding for monitoring, not necessarily federal funding for like housing programs or no, it's not direct funding for for that necessarily, but it's it is it is providing additional assistance to sort of make the policies real. The bridge. Um, you said the bridge. Yeah, I think of it as sort of a bridge into you know you just pass new laws now they need to yeah, how do they actually work? Um, the other piece I'll say though, some states can apply for something called the sub award, which is I think up to $500,000 that is sort of direct money to the state for an identified need um, that would assist in the implementation of those policies further. So some states have used that for things like data improvements, um, data system improvements, and some other areas that I don't know that they've ever been, I can double check, I don't know that it's ever been something as direct as sort of transitional housing. It's a one off, I mean it's only one chunk of money so it would be something that would come regularly. but. Um, States can identify and where agency improvements or implementation improvements could be boosted significantly by some additional direct funds from the from BJA. So, are you? Yeah. What? So, uh, my first blush at this by, by design more than anything else because I don't want to, I don't want to get clouded up by uh, Representative Emmons' opinions here. So my first. Did he actually say that? Yeah, yeah I did. We go back. <laughs> I did. <guess. laughs> uh, and it's slide 14, uh, or page 14, or how? Oh, yeah. Uh, my, my first takeaway from looking at that is it says, and then you have a form of opinion that because you're, you're still pretty early in the process. That we're doing pretty well in, in P and P, but we're failing pretty miserably at control. Is that a reasonable assessment at this time? I I would. Temper that a little, which is I agree. Well, I I, I want to because it is his furlough is just very unique, right? It's it's just a, a different thing in Vermont than it is anywhere else. Um, yes, a five percent prison admission rate for parole is very low. A twenty percent prison admission rate for probation revocations is low. Um, the furlough returns is is high. That it's very high. And that's where you see Vermont as, as number one in, in not a great way. But because local jails don't function in the way that they do in other places, because furlough returns, you know, at least 31% of those furlough returns are people who are only staying up to five days. So our assumption is those are the folks who are coming in at graduated sanctions. Um, so a, a decent chunk of them are coming in um, in response to violations that's not a full revocation that in other places where that might happen, it wouldn't go into your prison system and so it wouldn't have this impact. Um, and also, you've just sort of got an interesting design, again, in the way that furlough is defined, that kind of inherently means the response is going to be a little more punitive, perhaps, than it would otherwise. So it does, it does stand out, it's very high, but we think there are sort of structural reasons for that, some of which could be addressed through potentially some policy changes. And I'm wondering if some of those structural issues to furlough is, you know, DOC and legislators have been under a lot of pressure for the last five, six, seven years to release folks, to bring down our prison population. And I'm wondering, is there any correlation with that in that the folks who DOC has released, because there's been so much pressure not to incarcerate so many people, that folks have been released, they needed more community support than what we have in place. I would say that would be true almost no matter what with the population you have. I, I, I because we have a harder population than we did 10 years ago. A lot of people ago. coming out at very high risk. That's, that's true for anyone coming out of prison, right? Any post-release, immediate post-release prison or community population is going to have higher risk. 
And I think the fact that you already have a higher than perhaps normal risk population as far as who's making up your correction system means that you absolutely, there, there aren't a lot of um, low risk folks coming out on furlough. We just know that that's true. And so, yes, they are people who need more in the community um, and they are not succeeding. And when they're not succeeding repeatedly, it's not the first time, um, they are being returned to prison for, for different reasons and different lengths of time, but not for very long. Again, <coughs> mostly up to 90 days. And so it's, um, it's absolutely a two-pronged thing of the structure of furlough is problematic probably, and then also the lack of of other necessary supports in the community for people who absolutely need those things is going to be contributing to that as well. And then that contributes to the churn in DOC. Right. But then can't provide the adequate programming and space to the folks who are there that could use it because of the constant churn mm -hmm. in DOC is causing moving people around facilities to make mm -hmm. space. Yep. Again, it, we're referring to them as events, but 5,800 furlough return events in four years. That's a, a lot. lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> Plus, they're getting other folks coming in yep. and out. Like, how many folks do you have coming in on a yearly basis for admission? 5,000? Something like Derby. Can Diane yeah, Diane. If I may just add, talking about the federal funding on this front. So we're talking largely DOJ funding, BPA funding, which is largely technical assistance, um, the budget and the appropriations that's now passing through the House today and the Senate by the end of the week has a, a lot of, I think at the federal level, they're starting to see the whole government approach mm -hmm. that's kind of breaking down the barriers. So there, the SAMHSA funding, for example, is something to really take a good look at because they're, I mean, the MAT treatment that's happening right now in, in the prisons in Vermont is funded through federal funding as kind of to the state opioid response rate, mm -hmm. as is recovery housing, as is transitional some transitional um, recovery coaching in the in the hospital. So I think just to encourage um, legislators to think beyond DOJ when you're yeah. thinking about this, these funding. That, Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and the funding bill that's passing right now is is uh, well, really stepped up on that. Side. You're remiss if I didn't thank the senator for all this mm -hmm. hard work on these issues. We wouldn't be anywhere near where we are without him. And few others and down in Washington on these issues. That's uh, great. I'll, I'm happy to keep Please pass that on there. from the entire committee. I think we're all very thankful that we have them down there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any other that, I, are there other questions for Ellen? Ellen, thank you very much. I think the, you know, we're, we're going to be looking at January 22nd as our final meeting, and then on the 23rd, we plan to meet with the various standing committees with the Justice Center on what the bills will look like. Um, the good news, Bill, is that Senate Judiciary will start the bill. There will be a committee bill, and we hope to get it out. We'll clean it weeks. up when it comes to our agenda. Representative Brad and Representative Emmons and Representative Hooper promised to clean it up when it gets over there, along with Representative Hassan. Shaw will stay out of it. He promised to not, he promised to not mess it up. I promise I'll do my work harder. <laughs> Thank you so, all so much. Thank you, you all very much. Thanks, and uh, have an enjoyable holiday season.